All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Just bear with me for a second. All right, uh, good afternoon. I'm Josh Sun with the Department of Planning and Development. Please be advised that this meeting is being recorded and live streamed to the DPD's YouTube page. If you're part of a development team presenting today, uh, make sure that you hit the raise hand button on Zoom to make sure that you are a panelist. And Kamal will make sure you're elevated uh, welcome to the January 12th, 2022 meeting of the Committee on Design. To our esteemed committee, thank you for volunteering your time to be part of this advisory group. To the members of the public who are joining us, what you will see today and at future Committee on Design meetings are projects currently under review by DPD staff. The committee is a voluntary advisory body of design professionals that provide their expertise on design issues. This committee is not a substitute for plan commission as it is not a forum for public debate, nor is the advice of the committee legally binding. It is the hope that today's discourse will lead to recommendations that will elevate the design excellence of the city of Chicago. These recommendations will then be forwarded to DPD staff for consideration as they review these projects for plan commission and subsequent approvals. With that said, I will continue on to roll call, please state present or here if you are in attendance. Sarah Beardsley. Present. Thank you. Reed Kroloff. I believe he might arrive late. Brian Lee. Here. Thank you. <clears throat> Juan Moreno. And John Ronan. I believe he may be late as well. Ann Thompson. Present. Josh, I'm sorry if you didn't hear me, but I uh, had said present. Oh, that's fine. This is uh, Juan? Yes, it is. Awesome. Sorry, I'm like, I have another screen up, so I don't see anybody. <laughs> um, OK. Uh, Leslie Roth, I believe she's excused. Uh, Hana Ishikawa. Present. Great. The Astro Gates. Bob Faust. Uh, Renald Mitchell. Raquel de Reyes. Present. Okay. Great. So now that we have that. Wait a second. Okay. To members of the public, you are welcome to begin dropping comments and questions into the Q&A box. Committee members are invited to review uh, these comments during and after each presentation and incorporate the comments into the discussion. We will not be reviewing questions or comments from the public individually. To the applicant teams, please clearly state your name and your relation to the project prior to speaking. Uh, you will have, uh, I think for the first project, you will have approximately 20 minutes to present your proposal. Committee members, please hold your comments and questions until after each presentation. We will now move to the first item on the agenda. 
Uh, and feel free to, let's see, feel free to share screen. Thanks. Um, and then let me finish my spiel. Uh, all right, so the first item on, on the regular agenda is 1515 and 1641 West 47th Street and 4701 South Ashland Avenue, known as United Yards in the 20th Ward. The applicant proposes to redevelop multiple properties near Ashland Avenue and 47th Street. The project will redevelop a vacant city-owned lot at 1515 West 47th Street with a 50-unit affordable apartment building that includes a ground floor business hub and youth programming space. Additional phases will revitalize a large vacant four-story commercial building at 4701 South Ashland Avenue with 30 senior rental apartments and ground floor retail space. Redevelop vacant land at 1641 West 47th Street with a pair of affordable three flat buildings and enhance an existing supportive living center at 4707 South Marshfield Avenue with a ground floor retail space for local business, businesses, including a custom apparel shop, a bakery, and more. Uh, at this time, please proceed with the presentation and please state your name prior to speaking. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Good afternoon, Committee on Design members. Thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us today. My name is Sonia Eldridge and I'm a Southwest Region Planner for the Department of Planning and Development. Before introducing the United Yards team and their project concept, I'd like to take a few minutes to provide an overview of the Invest Southwest RFP process in back of the yards. The idea behind the Invest Southwest RFP process was to solicit quality development proposals for key parcels along commercial corridors, corridors excuse me, while taking it a step further than standard city RFP processes by engaging community members throughout the process to ensure the RFP and selected proposal reflected the needs and identity of the neighborhood. Design excellence and community wealth building were key tenants of this process. With pro bono support from the Lamar Johnson Collaborative through a partnership with the Chicago Architecture Center, we launched a community visioning process in the fall of 2020 to identify and select opportunity sites and retail gaps along the corridor. Residents attended visioning workshops led by LJC and shared their ideas around what they'd like to see in their community. The feedback and guidance received by residents directly shaped the programmatic goals of the RFP and the development scenarios created by the Lamar Johnson Collaborative, which formed the basis of the RFP, was released in November 2020. Community residents were involved throughout this process from RFP development to evaluation and finally respondent selection. So this is an aerial shot of the initial RFP site. Uh, which is city owned land located at 1515 West 47th Street at the corner of 47th Street and Justine. Uh, just for reference, Justine is about a block east of Ashland Avenue. So we led a, a, a robust uh, community engagement process which included everything from our monthly neighborhood roundtable meetings, uh, on the ground outreach, visioning workshops and, and surveys. And what we heard from residents is that they'd like to see more cultural and community spaces along the corridor, in addition to new retail options and small businesses, among other various priorities listed here. We received three responses to the RFP. 1515 West 47th proposed a single mixed use affordable housing development at the RFP site with total development costs of about 19.8 million. Back of the Yards Works proposed a single commercial building for the expansion of local businesses and organizations with a total development cost of about 15 million. This proposal did not include a housing component. United Yards proposed leveraging the RFP site into a four-site mixed-use project, including both affordable and senior housing, commercial and community spaces with total project costs of around $51.4 million originally but has since grown in scope to a, about a $60 million project. The community was able to engage in the evaluation process via this community scorecard you see here on the left. And we received uh, close to 300 responses, which we were um, ecstatic about. 
The evaluation committee included representatives from city agencies, as well as three community residents who are selected via lottery to serve as evaluators from a pool of around two dozen applicants. The two proposals that rose to the top through this evaluation process were United Yards for both its scope and catalytic impact, which looks to develop four separate sites, and then the community favorite, Back of the Yards Works, who put together a really thoughtful proposal in terms of community wealth building and supporting local businesses. And fortunately for us, uh, these two teams have begun to work together to combine their programs. Now I'd like to introduce to you uh, Scott Henry of Celadon, uh, the developer for United Yards. Scott? Thank you, Sonia. <clears throat> Thank you, Sonia. I think it's super exciting that we didn't have to choose between one great project and another, uh, and the two different parties were able to come together to create something even better than we possibly could imagine in the beginning. But it also takes a city willing to work as a partner and DPD really has done their part to make this process as productive as possible. We'd even include today's opportunity to speak with you, the Committee on Design, as part of that productive process. We embrace this opportunity almost as an amenity that's being offered to hear constructive feedback from so many top design minds in the industry. And really working with you is a, another true example of how a great project can be even better. And I hope that our project and our working relationship with the community DPD in the city will be seen as a model in Chicago and elsewhere as how we can best complete publicly funded projects. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. And now we'll turn the presentation over to Gabi Jagievich, um, the project architect. Gabi? Thank you, Sonia. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Scott. Um, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, my name is Gabriel Ignacio Jagievich, and I'm the president of Design Bridge Architects. Most people know me as Gabi. Um, and uh, I'm honored to be here to present our proposal for New City, which is, of course, part of the Invest Southwest program. Um, and I look forward to, I think as a team, we look forward to getting your feedback and insight to ensure this project is as successful as it can be. Um, and uh, so our proposal is, uh, is called United Yards, and this is an expansive vision in response to the RFP that was put out, it brings affordable housing to the RFP site, and proposes to improve three other parcels along 47th Street. Next slide. And this is really a, sort of the, the master plan image of, of the proposal from left to right. Um, you have a, a new six story, 50 unit, uh, mixed use, affordable um, apartment building um, with community centered ground floor spaces, a, uh, as well as, um, as you can see that the two buildings in the middle are uh, sort of these anchoring buildings for, uh, and, and really have the, the opportunity to be a front door for new city. And so as we go through the presentation, you'll see um, the rainbow building, which is this, the second building from the left is uh, what we're incorporating into our proposal to uh, restore and adaptively reuse into uh, 30 senior apartments with uh, new, new ground floor uh, spaces as well. Um, moving over to the Goldblatt's building, which is a project that Celadon Partners has uh, previously redeveloped. Uh, we're looking to uh, restore an existing blade sign that's there to create a new sort of identity signage for the community, um, as well as new ground floor uses with community partners. Um, and then site D on the right to the west is um, two vacant parcels that we're looking to uh, improve with uh, two, three flats uh, with six, um, six units of affordable housing. And we also have uh, are working toward trying to create some community green space in between those uh, two two sites between site C, D and C at a uh, Marshfield, which is currently a dead end uh, street. Community priorities uh, as part of the department planning's uh, um, process um, was founded to be affordable housing uh, at the top, um, health and wellness um, uh, services. Um, as well as all their social services, including youth programming and workforce development. And those are things that we took into consideration and, and things that we plan to incorporate into our, our ground floor um, um, storefronts. Um, of course, uh, design excellence is of uh, paramount importance to, to our firm and uh, something that um, we hold at the, at, the, at the forefront of what we do. 
Um, and I hope that um, that is translated in, in, as, in the design as we, as we go forward in the presentation. Project is in uh, the Southwest region uh, in back of the arts. Very quickly on the site analysis, I try to go through these fast. Um, we have, of course, uh, Ashland and 47th, Ashland connecting almost the entire city, um, north, uh, north and south. Um, and 47th Street is also a um, transit served location. Uh, the RFP site is in red um, there, um, currently a parking lot. And then you can see B, C, and D as we talked about before, the other sites, Rainbow, Goldblatt's, and then the vacant parcels. Zooming in on that a little bit, um, you have uh, site A, uh, which is the RFP site. Uh, you can see just an image of that. We can go back and look at these closer if we need to, but it's just a parking lot. Um, I don't know if it's an official parking lot or not. Uh, Rainbow Building uh, covered by a very uh, famous uh, uh, drive it sign um, there in site B. Um, and site C, Goldblatt's Building recently restored uh, terracotta. And then site D, um, is uh, also a, a parking lot as well as uh, two vacant parcels. Overview of, of the corner and what it, what it looks like today um, with the rainbow building on the left, the drive it sign, you can start to see a hint of the arches that are hidden underneath that hopefully. Um, and uh, next slide, context. Um, just to give you some context uh, on the very upper left image, you're looking back toward the RFP site um, on the moving clockwise, you have Goldblatt's building um, that, that's uh, to the east of Ashland. Um, and uh, below that, you see there's a Walgreens in front of uh, Goldblatt's currently, and that's the current streetscape condition, um, which I know CDOT's working on um, improvements to this, to this corridor as well, uh, which will hopefully bring more green and make it more pedestrian friendly. Um, and then of course, um, historic photo of the uh, Rainbow Building or the Depositor State Bank Building and what we hope to uh, bring it back to. Um, another view of the, the site, the parking lot, uh, there's a hotel across the street with a, a commercial uh, tobacco store on the ground level. And then uh, just below that image on the right uh, is uh, sort of the neighborhood on Justine, uh, which is the, the, the other street uh, at the corner of the RFP site. Uh, and then and highlighted in red again is, is sort of a view looking east on the RFP site. You can see uh, the parking lot on the right. And there's also a parking lot across the street, which is the, um, you know, uh, Fifth Third and Aldi uh, parking lot. And then on the right there uh, is the site D uh, images, which on the bottom right shows it very well. There's kind of the two vacant parcels. Um, and then there's a existing parking lot that serves uh, New City um, supportive life right now. Uh, just a very uh, snapshot of the zoning, uh, just showing the commercial corridors and, and really the typical commercial with uh, residential neighborhoods uh, beyond them. The existing conditions uh, of the, the aerial um, uh, for the things that we just described, kind of looking back at the um, you know, existing conditions, parking lot, rainbow building, which needs some, needs some love, um, and the, uh, the vacant lots on the very right with gold blats there anchoring the, the corner. And that moves into our, our development concept and we'll kind of reflect back on where we started um, with, you know, I think go back for one second. I just wanna uh, point out as we look at this that, um, you know, one of the things uh, we see that we're, we are constructing a, another anchoring building uh, to the 47th Street corridor. And in as we look at materials and things like that, that is, looking at the existing buildings, the Goldblatt's building, the Rainbow building, and sort of the neutral colors, uh, tones that are in those earth tone materials is something that we are reflecting in our definitely decidedly modern design. Um, but we'll, we'll go, we'll go in, as we look at materials, just wanna keep that in mind. Next slide. This is again, the master, master plan uh, of, of the site. Just note uh, across from the RFP is, is right now, there's not a lot of a lot of context, uh, you know, along this 47th Street um, near the near the RFP site. There's a you know the Aldi parking lot in the front um, uh, to this to the north of it, um, and then just this is just showing the uh, the connectivity east to west of, of the development. We'll get into the design of the RFP site. So this is a pretty tight site. Uh, it's 123 by 120. Um, so we're looking to really, you know, go edge to edge with this to, to get um, the target 50 units uh, for it. Um, and this is really the beginning of the design process, site plan. 
Um, and so we're looking at uh, parking, surface parking access from the alley. Um, uh, we did have a, a terrace uh, component, a roof terrace component as part of our project. Um, next slide. So as we, uh, and this is, this is uh, pretty much uh, not images that we created for this presentation, but this is our, our design process. Um, uh, we were very interested, this is a corner site, very interested in, in creating a dynamic corner and looking at uh, concepts of erosion and how uh, we can um, integrate uh, the, the roof uh, terrace into uh, kind of a dynamic design. So you're seeing uh, those, the, the selected um, massing is the middle one, um, which looks to kind of break down the scale of the building through this terrace expression that connects the ground level to the upper level. Um, and, um, and that's sort of, that's sort of the process that, uh, the design that we, we decided to go with as well as looking at the location of the terrace looking on the east side, which would be the best for, uh, for sun and not, uh, if this is the ground floor, um, uh, similar to what we discussed before, uh, surface parking. Uh, we have a retail uh, commercial opportunity that's uh, you know maximizing its its frontage on 47th Street um, with a program that we're we're developing and calling right now the Opportunity Hub, um, as well as uh, back of the house stuff uh, and a residential lobby. Uh, the typical, I think we missed in one slide, but did we miss? Yeah, typical floor. Uh, we're, we're getting uh, in the building, we're currently proposing uh, 50 units with uh, 10 three bedrooms, um, 12 two bedrooms and uh, 28 um, one bedrooms. These are these plans are very much in progress um, and are, are being developed um, as we go. So uh, there definitely will be tweaks to these, but in terms of the concept, in terms of the number of units, uh, we're, we're confident that we can, we can meet that. Um, this is the top floor with a, the roof terrace uh, shown in, in, in purple as well as a multi-purpose room and enclosed space. And some in progress elevations of, of the building. And then these uh, just, these are uh, more technical uh, drawings of, of, of the uh, design development uh, before, um, and we'll go into the, we'll go into the renderings. So sorry about that, everyone. Um, all right, and so this is uh, sort of the vision of, of the uh, 1515 um, uh, building development, mixed use building. So you can see the, the terrace expression kind of coming down to the street, breaking down the scale um, and leading your eye visually up. Um, we have an opportunity hub that um, will, that we're working on exactly the, the right operator and making sure it's, it's uh, um, informed by community um, and, uh, definitely uh, featured as part of our, as part of this building. Uh, also, there's a, there's a uh, program for public art that we're looking to get feedback from the community and, and the right, the right artist. Um, these are just other views, the ground floor. This is a view of the uh, terrace. And then we'll get into sort of the, the, the material concepts right now um, are uh, a, a masonry, um, definitely a, a durable material. And then um, with this metal panel and uh, corrugated metal inset um, that we're, we're studying the coloration of that um, and the scale of that. Cause the, you know, so these are just, these are just showing that we are looking at earth tone materials that will hopefully reflect the, um, the other histo the historic buildings in the, at, at, at the corner of 47th and, and Ashland. Department of Planning was interested in, in trying to get us to incorporate color into the project. Um, so we did do uh, some color studies here. Um, the very top left is the original one. Below that is where you can see V1. Uh, we did look at um, putting, you know, incorporating some color around the windows, which you see on some projects. Um, our initial reaction is to this is that um, we don't feel that it, it, it's strengthening the design to add any kind of color in this, in this way. Um, because the, the simplicity, the, well, the three, three dimensional quality, uh, of the facade as designed, you know, we're, we're incorporating this, you know, almost a, we're a four foot, a four foot setback and difference in materials. 
which is pretty big. And we, we feel like we don't want to distract from the simplicity of the form um, and the carving away of the materials. So we did look at other ideas. Uh, V2 at the top right is um, uh, just looking at maybe there's a way we can incorporate color underneath the canopy. Um, and then V3 on the bottom right is, you know, maybe there's uh, color at the ground floor and then maybe something at the, at the uh, roof level. Um, we are looking for your feedback on this um, and any kind of uh, input uh, to, to come up with the right solution here. And that moves us to uh, building uh, site B, which is the Rainbow Building Restoration Adaptive Reuse. Again, this is just a, a, an image looking back uh, west uh, down 47th Street showing um, the impact of, of redeveloping these, these sites and the Rainbow Building um, in, uh, at the corner there. And really the concept to maximize the street activation. Um, so the, the intent here is to fully restore the exterior of this building. Um, there are some, you know, the, the rainbow uh, store will remain, uh, but just with new storefronts. Um, I think you can go to the next one. Uh, but there are some vacant uh, storefronts um, along 47th that we're looking to fill. Um, you know, there'll be a residential lobby there as well as another uh, retail use that we're working on. Next slide. And then just 30 units of, of senior housing is, is, the, is, the, is the concept for this building right now. At, at the second floor, it's a, it's a full floor and then it, it goes to kind of a skinnier building. Next slide. Um, looking at the current conditions on the left, upper left, and then historic photo. Um, and then a, a view of, of that restored building. With, with the new building, with the uh, 1515 building in the background. So another, another view starting to step into site uh, C a little bit, but starting to see the connectivity between uh, the 1515 site, the, the rainbow site, and then um, you know the Goldblatt's building currently with the restored blade sign. Uh, moving all the way west, um, to site D. This is a, a very fluid part of our project. We're still working through a lot here. Um, but the concept originally is, uh, was and is to uh, incorporate um, module, the modular housing along 47th Street, so um, as well as some sort of community green space. Um, go to the next one. So this is uh, probably the most accurate to, to what we had originally proposed with the modular housing, um, that we would put them on the two vacant lots and then uh, retain the existing parking lot that's there. And then now we're current, we're also, we're exploring the idea of actually um, incorporating a, a new uh, commercial building along 47th street that would, um, you know, face the street. Um, maybe there'd be a corner plaza and then rotating the, the modular three flats to uh, face Marshfield. And um, again, this is something that we are um, working through. Um, and these are just concepts that we're looking for feedback on. And I believe, uh, just a real quick point, those are the, these, these three flats are constructed already, I believe, and, and these are the two facades for, for what they are. Um, and these are by uh, another firm, not from, not from DesignBridge. Um, and I think that's it. And this is that, is, that is United Yards. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby. Um, so is that all for this project, I guess? That's everything. All right, awesome. Um, all right, so committee members, please take a moment to review any comments received from the public in the uh, Q&A box uh, and incorporate them however you see fit, uh, but it does not look like there's anything. Um, so, uh, as of now, the floor is yours for comments and questions to the applicant. Like it, Josh, I'll jump in if that's okay. Yes, please go for it. I just, um, you know, admittedly, Gabby, I'm a fan of your work and I think, um, it's wonderful that we get a chance to hear you up front and uh, your conviction for the community and what you care about. And 
there's no no doubt that everything you do embodies design excellence. I think this is a terrific, an absolutely terrific example of what you can do with simplicity and elegance and dignity in affordable housing. I, I just think it's it's absolutely wonderful. I also, um, you know, this is gonna be less of a critique, my friend. This is gonna be just kudos to you, but I think it's worth saying. Um, I think it's great even the way that you're studying the color because at times we tend to forget that the underbelly of elements are facades as well. And that from the human condition, because we get so used to just seeing renderings from a bird in flight, that from the human condition and we're looking up, those are facade elements. And I think your exploration of the underbelly is, you know, whether that leads to, to color or not is not the, the subject I wanted to bring up. I just think it's quite wonderful that you're exploring it that way. Um, without a doubt, like this also is a scenario as you, we look at what's in front of us, this is going to create incredible change on 47. Like, and it's absolutely wonderful. It's like we're seeing this storyline of, you know, a ground up and what could be done, a repurposing that can be done, a uh, revitalization of history. This is incredible timelines of what's possible when conviction and like I said earlier, the, the, the true absolute sincere belief in design excellence comes to the fore and is given a chance. I think my friend is always, you're, be, you're to be commended. I wish I could have given you a little critique. I would have enjoyed that just because it's you, but I think uh, today's a day to really celebrate your work because I think it's quite wonderful. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I believe Sarah is next. Thank you. Yeah, I would just echo um, the comment that was given about the quality of the proposal today. And I really appreciate what's being done with the historic properties and trying to keep true to what was there. It would be amazing if the Rainbow Building could be restored in the way it's rendered, and I hope it can. Um, I would, on parcel A, when I talk about the color or not color, um, I do, I understand the comment you made about just keeping to the purity of the original um, concept. And what I would say about that is we should look at the cut in the building. Um, I don't know if you can pull up one of those renderings of, of that shows the terraces. Uh, for me, from the original concept rendering to the more um, developed rendering, yeah, right there. Uh, my question would be, could we make those terraces more special? Right now they look like they're coated with green, but they're not used and there's no planter boxes up there. And I know there's structural concerns and constructability, but my question would be, you know, can we make a little more of that move in a way that is um, in, that keeps to the original concept and maybe not try and, and force color where it may not want to be, but enhance the garden experience with planter boxes or possibility for occupied terraces or something like that. Um, and then the other comment I had on the, the rainbow site was just, I was wondering if there was any community space for the senior living or any green space, because I know that, you know, seniors need that too. And if there was any possibility to do that, it would enhance the project. Um, thank you so much for that question. Um, I want to respond to the, the first part. Um, I think that this that detail is like the divine detail for the project in terms of the terraces. And it's something that we really need to, um, you know, focus on. They're currently not. And I don't think our intention is to make them occupiable, but certainly we do want to, uh, you know, meet what the design um, concept is. And that is incorporating uh, some sort of planter in there. Um, and so that would be as well as a green, a green screen wall uh, component. So it's, I think it's something that we need to, we need to study, whether it's the, the, the parapet of the masonry going up higher, or if it's a piece of aluminum that creates a planter. Um, that's something that we're, we, we know is important uh, to, to, to make our project look like this rendering. <laughs> so it's something that we're going to try to do. Um, does that answer that part? 
Yeah, I think so. I, th I think there is more you could do with that detail. And even if it's not occupied, maybe there's an allowance that could be more green or different type of green up there. Um, I could see it just becoming an extensive green roof and not being maintained. And, and it would, that's not what you want to have this design implemented. So. Okay. Um, and then with regard to the, 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 the rainbow building and the green space, I, I don't think that right now we do have any. Um, we were looking to try to create some community green space in that Marshfields, uh, you know, um, street if we if it's possible, uh, because there really isn't any park, there really isn't any green space in this in this community right now. So we really like to do that. Just so we're clear, because I, I think I heard the question differently, Sarah. Were you were you referring to community space? Uh, not like open space, but like actual like a like a physical space in the building. That could also be a way to do it. I just, uh, when you get to be a senior, I think that they may want some sort of community space or respite space where they could socialize and things like that. Um, this is Scott Henry. If you don't mind, I might uh, add a thought or two. Uh, I'm the developer. We hear you loud and clear. I think that as we get in further into the design of the layouts of the interiors, we will look for opportunities to enhance that community space. Uh, there also, the intention here is really a continuum of living. So folks living that are seniors, that are independent, that are living uh, in the Rainbow Building will also be able to benefit from all the things that we offer in the supportive living facility. And there's lots and lots of amenity space there. I do recognize it's across a busy street. But lastly, uh, Sonia in the very beginning hinted at the project growing in scope and we can't really uh, uh, talk about that too much publicly yet, but we're looking for other opportunities that we're hoping to uh, announce soon that will uh, we'll provide some of those things that you're, you're talking about. So uh, see a few hands up here. Just wanna make sure we have a, an order. I, I have a list yeah. of okay, great. you. Thanks. So um, Renald is next. Yeah, thanks, Josh, and, and um, Happy New Year, um, first of all, to, to everyone. Um, you know, hope your holidays were, were relaxing and, and, and joyful. Um, you know, Gabby, I'm, I'm going to get on the love train with, with, um, <laughs> you know, with, with my colleagues. Um, you know, this is a fantastic, expressive project, and, and it's one that's frankly emotional for me um, because, you know, some of you know this, others may not. Um, you know, I grew up in two Chicago communities, um, you know, for, you know, my early days in, in Bronzeville, um, in public housing, um, and then, you know, my teen years on the edge of New City and West Inglewood. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I remember many a, a trip with my grandmother, um, you know, down the Ashland Corridor, you know, shopping at Goldblatt's and, you know, Rainbow and even further north, you know, what, you know, uh, a space that went through several iterations. It was a Zare at one point, it was a Venture at another point. <laughs> it became a flea market, might still be the flea market you know, to this day at some point. So, so, so to see the love and the care you know, that, that you've invested, you know, and it's, it's, it's visceral, it's, it's palpable. Um, you know, again, I, I'm excited um, to see it. Um, with respect to you know, the RFP parcel, I completely agree with your, your instinct and inclination to, to not over, um, you know, colorize, if I can make up a word, um, the facade, I think it's pure. I think the expression is pure. I, I think there are plenty of opportunities, you know, for color expression, whether it be, you know, it, with art, you know, at the streetscape or, or even, you know, the vegetation, you know, and, you know, how your LA, you know, decides to go about that, you know, at, at the, the street level, at the human realm, or even climbing the building. You know, even the, the green gestures that you've expressed, you know, you know, in the rendering, they're generally monochromatic. Um, they could be, you know, you can, you can activate that, you know, in, in a more, you know, direct way uh, with creative landscaping. So I, I don't think the building needs, you know, any, any pops of color. I think the, the pure expression, you know, I, I, I trust and, and agree with your instincts in that regard. The only thing I would, you know, say, and if you want to cycle forward or, it may be forward or it may be back to the overall 47th street, you know, you know, panorama, you know, that, that shows the entirety of the development.
That one, yeah, no, thank you. Um, you just, and again, it's subtleties because you're very early on, you know, in design, but just, you know, again, looking at some of the, um, the fenestration proportions, you know, you know, you know, between the rainbow building and the gold blacks building and, and you're wondering, I know some of those lines you did, I could see the expression and, and the carry in forth of some of those lines, you know, into, you know, what you, you already conceded to as a decidedly modern, you know, expression. You know, again, it's one that I, I don't disagree with. I think your instincts are spot on. I, I think there may be an opportunity for further exploration in terms of, you know, those, you know, punched opening proportions and tying that thread even more, you know, uh, together, you know, along that corridor. But, but again, like I said, that's, that's all subtleties, my friend. I, I love this. And even down to the flats, um, you know, I guess for me personally, and it, I'd definitely be interested to hear from some of my other colleagues on this, I even like the, the notion of fronting 47th Street with the modular building and, and not rotating them. I know that's something that, you know, basically, you know, was, was you know, considered and encouraged, but you don't often see, you know, street vacation in a give back, you know, you know as a you know, gesture of, of green space in this way, in this manner. And it's, it's something that personally excites me. I mean, others might disagree, but, you know, again, I'm, I'm intrigued by that and would want to, you know, see that played to the hilt. So, so again, you know, congrats, my friend. And, and again, I'm looking forward to seeing this come to fruition. I think Sarah's comment regarding, you know, further exploration of, of space for seniors is, is spot on, you know, and again, but, you know, as, as you and as Scott said, there'll, there'll be time for that. So, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I think you're next. I was just gonna say, I believe we're on this project. My team is telling me we are. And so I need to recuse myself. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. And I think you're next, you'd like to comment. Great, thank you. Um, well, first of all, I, 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 I with Renosa, said, I'll, I'll join the love train. Um, I, first of all, I wanna congratulate the development team because I love that you're taking such a comprehensive approach to looking at the whole street as opposed to individual sites. And this is really exciting um, to see such an, an aggressive look uh, at the whole condition, which is, is, really, is really wonderful. Um, and Gabby, I think you've done a great job uh, addressing kind of different types of buildings and different components of this whole streetscape, which is really fantastic to see. Um, I did have a couple uh, comments on just different aspects, particularly on the A building. Um, I really like the design strategy that you're employing there. I do question a little bit the choice of materials, and this is kind of a, a, a picky, comment, but sort of the scale of those materials, I wonder about the corrugated metal. Um, and I think it'll be really important for you to consider uh, exactly what material that is, and that, it, that it has, that it reads as the high quality material that you want it to, which will have a lot to do with the way that it's detailed and the scale. And then making sure that the scale of that material is really um, composed nicely or balanced against the texture of the brick. Um, because it could be one of those, I think it's a, a game of subtleties that could be highly successful and it could be really challenging. And I know this is where you'll get into issues of budgets and availability and all those things that are, that are complicated. So I would just, um, I wanted to make a comment about that because I think it'll be so impo important to make strong decisions about those two materials, not just what they are, but the exact, um, exact scale, exact material and the way that they're detailed. I love the depth of the building, especially at some of the openings. And I'm hoping that you'll be able to maintain that as this moves through the design process, um, because I think that's successful. Um, as somebody else said, I, I love the idea of exploring um, the undersides of some of the, of the setbacks if you want to integrate color. I think that that could be really interesting and a subtle way to bring color through the building. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of buildings lately where that face that turns back into the window is color. And I, I love uh, exploring another strategy for, for incorporating um, color if that's where you choose to go with this. Um, 
Just a couple other um, sort of small sort of technical and, and sort of maintenance kind of issues. Um, I know you, I think you mentioned that you were exploring uh, kind of an innovation opportunity hub for the ground floor, um, which I think would be great. You may want to build some flexibility into that retail as you develop it, just so that if it ends up being multiple retail, um, or if you decide that that opportunity hub doesn't take up the full frontage, that the design can accommodate multiple um, tenants in that ground floor if need be, um, either from day one or into the future, that there's a strategy for that. Um, um, also considering kind of maintenance of the green elements of the building, I really like integrating some kind of green um, as you see it cascade down that building. It actually would be really great to see something like that incorporated even in the, in the restored buildings so that you see this green strategy uh, carry through to all of the buildings that you're addressing. Um, but under, you know, kind of thinking through how you'll maintain that, is it irrigated? You know, if this is a senior building, you want to make sure that that green survives and, and thrives in the environment. So making sure, you know, considering options for irrigation, how will you maintain it? Just kind of thinking through some of that long-term operational issues, which are important in buildings like this that, that often don't have big budgets for that. Um, and then last, um, I did look at some of the floor plans that, you, that were submitted as part of the project. Um, I'd encourage you to continue to study the unit plans, um, particularly window placement, kitchen size. Um, you know, this is our, our chance to really in, improve the quality of affordable housing. I think that there's some room for improvement on the plans. Um, there was a few units that had fairly small windows and living spaces, sizes of kitchens and things like that. You, I, I think that um, they could benefit from some additional exploration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Overall, I think it's a fantastic project. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Thompson. Uh, I wanted to just say a couple, just a couple of responses because I, I agree 100% on the, uh, you know, the, the material um, in terms of, you know, the, you know, hitting or missing that. Because, <laughs> you know, I know the corrugated sounds kind of scary and maybe it might not work. So I do think that the scale is super important. The finish is super important. And you know whether it is metal at the end of the day, I, I think we definitely can keep that open and look at you know what the options are there. And yeah, I think it's when the devil's in the details for that. Yes, because sure. <laughs> <laughs> it could start to look really cheap, and I, we don't want that. So we certainly will uh, be looking at that very closely and get a lot of different uh, samples and 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 study that. Uh, with um, with regard to the, the plans, yeah, definitely the, these are early and I, you, we took the furniture out there. They're not, they're, they need to be, they need to be really looked, scrubbed a lot. So agree with you. And then on the um, irrigation, we are working with site. So <laughs> on this, and they're going to be helping us, uh, you know, find the right, I believe that was part of the conversation uh, for the, for those planters, but yeah, we do, oh, we're, we're early there, but yes, it was, it was brought up. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll find something that's going to, that's going to work. Great. And I, I think, I don't know if Scott would want to talk about the, um, the opportunity hub at all. Um, no, just, just from the standpoint that, you know, it's, there's going to be lots of folks involved with that, including the, um, the other, uh, team that, that joined ours. Uh, so there, there's a there's a lot of wood to chop there, uh, but I we hear you. We want to keep the uh, that space flexible because we know that the the needs of that space will evolve over time. Um, so we hear you loud and clear. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I believe Gokola had her hand up next. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, as a developer, this is an incredibly ambitious project. Um, so we're not just looking at one particular site, we're looking at four different sites, which is incredible in a key key, the heart, the heart of back of the yards. We're very familiar with, with back of the yards. Um, so I will say as a developer, I'm a little worried about it because um, each one of these deals 
it's it's going to take a lot of financing and a lot of uh, brain damage. So I truly, truly root for you guys to get it done the way you put it in here, because if it does, if everything gets done the way you have it in the paper, um, it's going to truly transform back of the yards. And, and this is what, every, what, what we all want. Um, in, in regards of the, uh, the 1515 building, uh, it's beautiful. And I'm not an architect, uh, so for what it's worth, um, I agree with what has been said that the, the colors are all dancing together here, you know, holding hands. That's kind of how I see it myself. Um, the color concept, you know, introduction of color, it could be, but I think, uh, Gabby, you are creative enough to find ways at the ground level, for example. I will recommend you have some beautiful windows at the ground level. Uh, maybe there are some walls that can be utilized of community murals, local artists. Uh, so the human uh, condition, as Juan mentioned it earlier, uh, can benefit from that. Um, I, I admired how you broke the building. I, I have worked with you in the past, so I know you are good at that. Uh, this is not a monster building, uh, so I, I, it's beautiful. It is not precast. Um, I am a fan of precast, but I have to say, this is a great opportunity to demonstrate that there are other ways of doing beautiful, affordable housing buildings, and this is one of them. I love these windows, the size of the windows. Uh, it's, it's beautiful, outstanding. Um, in terms of the green space, the terrace and the planters, which I think are clearly desperately needed to break the size in the massing, but also the introduction of the color. I will caution some maintenance um, because I really think that you need to make an effort to do the, the, uh, the, the terraces, um, you know, bring them to life as in this picture. I'm, I'm not gonna remember this picture, um, but and I know you, your developer, I'm sure they do man, uh, property management, so they are familiar with this, you know, maintenance challenges, in, you know, when you introduce something like this. Uh, uh, roof, green roof are hard to maintain, as I believe Sarah mentioned it earlier, so that's an important point to consider. But it, it, I truly value this idea of introducing that kind of color and, 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 and breaking down the massing of the building. Uh, making it to the human condition, you know, uh, friendly, uh, accessible. Um, I also agree strongly with the need of senior space in the other building, uh, within the building, uh, because I think that is also important is to, you know, help to build up the, the community spirit to create those, those spaces. Also believe with what Ant Hansom just said about the uh, commercial on this on the 1515 building to make it a multi-purpose because these are challenging times um, and you want to see how you can have local and I know you're working with local businesses but nevertheless this is a great opportunity to embrace them with their challenges um, I I I'm just going to also add the fact that the units the design of the units as Gabby you mentioned and I believe and do need more work uh, but overall, this is a great building, extremely challenging. So I'm going to cross my fingers that uh, your developer is able to secure all the funding because uh, we want this to be done. Uh, we don't want this to be drawings in a bookshelf, right? So good work. And affordable housing can be beautiful. All right, um, and I think uh, we have Brian next. Hi, uh, see, so can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I want to maybe first echo uh, many of the comments that uh, the project is really a commendable project um, that uh, could potentially have very high impact uh, to the neighborhood. Uh, I think we all recognize that, so kudos to um, uh, DPD, uh, certainly the community, getting them to have community input, 
the developer uh, taking on this um, ambitious project, as what Chloe said, and the design team. You know, I think that <clears throat> um, as much as I can uh, uh, discern, the programs appear to be very thoughtful. Uh, they're community oriented, uh, and they, I think, really would go a very long way in terms of um, the goal of not only activating 47th Street, uh, but also really revitalizing this entire surrounding neighborhood and, frankly, creating value um, for all the surrounding properties. Uh, I think it's really wonderful that uh, you're saving the Rainbow Building and the new city of supportive building. Um, uh, there's quite fine buildings, and I think that you know cleaning them, them up uh, of those lighter and cream brick and terracotta tones um, would be really just fine. Um, I think that one of the things that's interesting to me, though, is as you see those two buildings, which obviously are, are fine gateway buildings to Ashland, uh, there are a number of other buildings um, on that street uh, and across the street. And so how do you actually develop a, an idea where you recognize the context uh, of the site, um, neighborhood, and do you do a building that is... Uh, of the scale um, and quality in terms of character of the Rainbow Building in New City? Or do you actually try to uh, think about uh, some of the other more common brick buildings uh, and the scale of those buildings that exist in the, in the area? And I, I think they have, obviously you have to recognize that, you know, it's kind of a still a little bit of a blown out uh, hub right now, um, especially not only in terms of the existing buildings, but especially with um, the Fifth Third Bank and all these uh, uh, supermarket the be parking lots across the street that, you know, it's almost like one sided. So we, I don't know if those things would change in the future. And certainly because of your development being, you know, a really a catalytic um, uh, initiative, maybe things would change. Um, you know, the, the package I got, uh, I might have, uh, Joshua, I might have downloaded an earlier package because I actually didn't see um, drawings, plans of um, the new city and uh, Rainbow and um, the Marshland pro projects in my package. Um, so that just might be a, a note for you, but uh, I just maybe want to make some comments on the um, 1515. Um, I think 1515, uh, first of all, the renderings were a little confusing to me um, because they didn't match the plan. And I think particularly, you know, the, uh, the major move of the, the erosion, the, the terracing that moves up through the corner, which um, I'm not quite sure. I um, I mean, I know it accentuates the corner, um, but um, you know, I think that it's something I'll just leave as something that you have the kind of creative authority to kind of decide that that's your move. But when you look at the plans um, and then try to compare them to the ren renderings, uh, the renderings show a very significant setback, you know, that has planted terraces as well as um, green walls. And then you look at the plans and the plans really uh, suggest not a four foot setback as you, as you described, but really it looks like, you know, a couple of feet or, you know, a foot or something like that. And I think that, you know, it, it's, I'm not here to just to, um, you know, um, you know, complain about that, but it really points to a, a uh, fundamental question about this issue of building affordable housing and making sure everything works from the inside out because it is on very tight budgets and there are certain systems that are recognized, may not be innovative, but they're recognized in the Chicago construction market as that's the way we do things. And the certain unit plans of that's the way we do things, you know. Uh, and so I kind of echo Anne's comments that I think one of the most important things you could do for affordable housing is really develop great plans that are obviously smaller, but highly efficient, very, very usable. Um, the rooms aren't small. I mean, some of those bedrooms look tiny. Um, and that all the kind of components of and, and kind of qualities of those spaces really contribute to a very livable space and really promote you know, health and wellness that uh, even you talked about in the very beginning. So that's that's one thing that I think is going to be a, a, certainly a conflict of figuring out those plans and making sure everybody's got the right sizes and they don't get to be too small because you're trying to do something 
on the exterior to have this gesture. And then it's going to, you know, make units, you know, four or five foot smaller across its entire face. So uh, that's kind of the one comment. The, um, the base of the building, that I, you know, I think we all like the guy, degree of transparency and openness and have this mass floating above it. Uh, and so I think that, though, that you probably should really study that. Uh, it's no question to me that, you know, you should have the entry as inviting and warm as possible. It should really be activated with the lobby that allows people to wait, um, sit, you know, be the mayor of the street um, and really connect to the neighborhood. And the other programs you have in vision, I'm sure would uh, also continue to um, reinforce that idea of activating the street. I think that, you know, getting back to um, maybe, um, you know, the context, you know, I think um, uh, Sarah, not Sarah, Hannah, sorry. Um, I know Sarah is a cow, Hannah is a cow of sight, recluse herself, but, um, you know, you really should think about uh, the landscape of the street. Uh, there's a widened sidewalk on Justine that certainly should have big street trees and some sort of planting and uh, having some art uh, that should, certainly should be local uh, of something, uh, I think could be a really key feature. I did want to ask a question. You can make a note that um, I think our earlier drawing, you covered the parking with a deck uh, to probably to create some additional open space. Uh, did I see that in the one that earlier drawings or um, that flashed on the screen? That was, so, uh, that was the original concept by Lamar Johnson. Oh, okay. So I know that would be added at a cost, but uh, if you could even, you know, work with landscape architects who I think obviously are very good and would um, really advocate for planning a significant landscape to help um, mitigate the scale of the six story building and what essentially is a three story context along that area. So um, I think that, like I said, you know, those major setbacks, you know, if you can get them done, great. I know that they're complicated framing. Um, or is there some other thing that you can do to certainly have uh, a way to not just be, um, you know, changing materials or doing different colors on facade? Because to me, those are just kind of like, um, I should say lipstick on the, the proverbial animal, right? And um, there's lots of different ways to do that. I think that the, 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 the datum of the three-story buildings, the Ashland Hotel across the street, even though that's kind of a lousy building, probably be torn down, but the housing around, around it, um, there might be something that, that recognizes that um, because you do have this very strong two-story datum of the Rainbow Building. Uh, and then how do you consider breaking up the mass? Um, in terms of fenestration, whether it be the windows, the framing of the windows, the, um, whether or not there's horizontal breaks, whether there's vertical breaks, um, you know, all those kind of things, obviously, you know, as, as uh, the, the tools and, and the kind of features that might uh, go along to thinking about how you connect the inside to the outside, right? Um, these three, these P3 projects that are the initiative of South and, and West are, is um, really, I think, really great as kind of illustrated uh, with your guys' uh, proposal for uh, uh, all four projects. Uh, and I think they're really fantastic. And I had hoped that, and I think it will happen, that um, the developers and the designers would work very closely together, recognizing that, you know, because you guys have been given this opportunity and you have really seized it, that you really could come up with something that is new creates value and potentially new models for the community and family uh, health and wellness, which I think is ultimately what we're all really interested in. Thank you. Um, I just wanna uh, thank you for all the comments and uh, I just wanna comment, uh, respond on the plans and, and the terracing. I think it's certainly, uh, the setback is certainly not something that you see on uh, on any buildings because it isn't easy to do. <laughs> and uh, what we what we submitted is is definitely in progress. But our intention and and I have studied this is that um, we can make the four foot setback work. Um, the plans are not are not caught up yet, but it'll it'll it it it's something that I you know we've done a lot of housing, and um, it's certainly something that the plans will will be worked out. And and often you work on plans for months and months and months as you're developing the drawings. And we'll, we're gonna make beautiful unit plans 
um, for the building. And they're going to be, they're going to be decent sized units. And I agree a hundred percent that the living spaces are not quite right yet. And uh, it's, it's something that we are, we're going to be working on. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I could chime in. Uh, thanks, Brian, for and all, all of the committee members for those great comments. <clears throat> Just um, to build off of one of the earlier comments around like uh, Wakolda's comments around feasibility and wanting to see this project become a reality. Um, you know, we can let the project team speak to this a little bit, but our understanding is site D um, could actually be the first of, you know, the four sites to break ground. And so from the department's perspective, we we're very interested in kind of resolving the site planning and site layout um, options and considerations there um, so that the development team can hit the ground running and, and we can celebrate um, that kind of first phase of, of groundbreaking. So really interested to hear, uh, Renald gave some really interesting insight, um, interested to hear from the rest of the group, um, your thoughts on, on this idea. And I'll just give a little bit of context of, certainly the discussion we've been having with the development team is from a land use perspective, um, you know, traditionally having commercial fronting 47th Street, which is the commercial corridor to us makes a lot of sense. Um, and, um, you know, uh, being able to do that in a way that reconfigures the existing parking lot and rotates the three flats, the modular three flats uh, towards um, uh, towards the more residential street, Marshfield, um, seem to kind of resonate with the department. Um, but obviously there's, there's implications to both schemes and certainly would like to hear from, from the committee some thoughts on uh, what could be most successful and, and what considerations do both the department and the development team need to account for as, as this site is, is getting resolved. Yeah, Sarah, if you'd like to start. Yeah, I thought it was interesting too to hear the comment that we didn't necessarily mind rotating or leaving the buildings as they are in, as opposed to rotating them. I think it's based upon the specific site and not having been to the site, it's hard for me to say, but I do know just from living in Chicago for so many years on the south and the west side, that it's pretty common to have apartment buildings facing a retail thoroughfare. And often it adds some activation to the street um, and the consideration that's usually done to make them more successful is you try to have, you know, some privacy, whether it be a really good, um, you know, fence or landscape wall, or you raise it up on steps so that that for first floor unit doesn't feel so exposed. Um, but I've seen them work quite well facing commercial streets and the amenity of the park, if that were a trade off would be you know, something that may be good for the neighborhood. If you turn them toward the residential street, then I agree you still need to have something to activate that corner and not just leave a blank wall um, there once they're turned. And if you turn them, they'll feel more like they're part of the neighborhood street. But if the neighborhood street is a lot of single families and these are three flats, um, you know, it can work, but it, it is a different typology. I guess that's not an answer, but it's just some thoughts and maybe it could work either way. Ms. Um. Guacolda? Yeah, I agree with what Sara said. I mean, um, it, it, I like seeing residential on 47th Street. Uh, there is there, there's a lot of commercial storefronts that are vacant. And I know that this development overall with all these buildings, uh, are gonna bring more attention, more traction, more traffic, uh, economic development. But I think it also breaks down a little bit the massing in the sense that you have a, a three flat, they are residential. So um, yeah, maybe because my personal experience, we do have a building on Damon Street actually that, or uh, actually actual uh, on Ashland, that is a residential building 100%. Um, so maybe I'm biased from that perspective. Yeah, and, and there's certainly precedent for, um, you know, residential buildings fronting commercial corridors, particularly for some reason, it's something that tends to happen at corners. 
Um, you know, I think to Sarah's point that how those buildings interact with the street um, is very different than kind of a typical residential street setback. Um, and even, you know, elevation changes, et cetera. Um, I'm, I'm interested to hearing some thoughts from the team, either Scott or, or Gabby, around the, the kind of modular um, building and, and, and whether there is any flexibility within um, the modular typology to allow for, you know, for that type of like site response. Scott, would you like to speak to this one? Sure. I, <clears throat> you know, we, uh, we're, I don't want to say that we're uh, struggling with this, but, um, you know, how to pull this part off of the project. Um, we want to make sure that we do it just right. Um, there are aspects to both schemes that we really like. In terms of the flexibility, I will say again uh, that uh, these units have been manufactured and they're, they're ready to deploy. In fact, you know, one of the exciting parts about this, this particular Invest Southwest uh, project is that, that we'll start to see activity almost immediately. It'll, you know, we'll probably be able to put those uh, buildings and those modular buildings in, um, in within the next three, four months. Um, but we want to do it right. Uh, certainly, um, showing it the way it's shown here, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't really comply with zoning, having ground floor entry um, for, for first floor uh, apartments. But we do think that um, uh, we, we, we don't think it's a, it's a, it's a super great departure uh, from, because, uh, be, because we're having a lot of other retail space in say the Goldblatt's building. So it's not like we're losing an opportunity to put retail uh, at, at 47th Street. Um, we, we like this option, especially because it does allow us to uh, uh, you know, in, uh, realize our original plan and that's to uh, vacate va uh, uh, Marshfield and create a nice community garden. We think that has a lot of benefit for an area that doesn't have a lot of green space. Uh, on the other hand, we do recognize that there, are, you know, there, there is some neighborhood context that we have to respect. And we did uh, wanna look at the alternative uh, strategy where the, uh, we rotate those units 90 degrees. Um, you know, we think the overall scheme is terrific. Uh, it, it, it also does afford us more flexibility for our new partners, uh, uh, the uh, Back of the Arts Neighborhood Works uh, group. Uh, to be able to put some of their activity in that in a new commercial building right on 47th, but it does impact this community garden concept that we had envisioned, um, which you know is really an important part of the vision. Um, so I, I I think I, I would uh, ask the the committee again uh, to help us through this struggle uh, and and. Um, and, and provide some more feedback. But I think if I had my druthers and I, I could pick uh, right now, it'd probably be the original vision just because of that community garden, but would, would love to, to hear more comments if, if you think there's other creative approaches to this uh, design problem. It's like, uh, Rinaldi, you have your hand up. Yeah, and, and certainly didn't mean um, uh, Gerardo to um, open a Pandora's box, <laughs> you know, on this. Um, no, but, that, that, that was the intent. We wanted to have this discussion, so so thank right. you for bringing it up. Alrighty, but um, you know, I guess you know, again, you know, personal proclivities, you know, notwithstanding, um, you know, to, to me, you know, it, it boils down to you know, you know, what is ostensibly an an East Coast you know, way of thinking, you know, with respect to streetscape and urban, you know, design versus a Midwest, you know, approach. Um, you know, you know, ground level walk-ups are common, you know, all along the eastern seaboard. Um, whether you're in Washington, DC or New York or Philadelphia, you know, or or, or other, you know, eastern cities of age, colonial cities. Um, and so, you know, for me, the gesture of giving back you know, you know, green space by, by way of vacating, you know, a, a street, you know, to me is one of the linchpins of this whole, you know, vision, you know, here, you know, to, to Scott's point. And, and I just personally would, would, you know, hate to see that compromised, you know, 
you know, for the sake of, of tradition, <laughs> you know, frankly, in terms of you know, how we normally do things, you know, in, in, in Chicago. Um, you know, I think someone was asking about the, the flexibility or adaptability of, of these modular buildings. You know, I, I guess what immediately comes to mind for me is, you know, they're going to have to be put on foundations. You know, what's to say that we don't raise them, you know, elevate them by four feet or five feet um, still doesn't change the modularity, you know, of construction. It may add some dollars in terms of how you ground it. Um, but, you know, again, I, I think there are opportunities to address, you know, some of Sarah's points and, and concerns, you know, while, while creating, you know, something different. You know, something that you don't see every day, you know, in this city. This is Scott, not, not to interject. I, I do want to mention, though, uh, having our uh, all of our apartments handicap accessible, super, super important to us. Uh, we really deliberately wanted to keep those ground floor units at grade um, so that we can promote that that accessibility. Uh, you're correct that we could elevate those, those buildings. Um, but I, I would, I would, I would really, uh, urge us to, to continue to do everything we possibly can to make as many units as possible accessible to folks with physical disabilities. Well, there's also the possibility of the treatment of the front yard, and, you know, and elevating it isn't the only way to give it some feeling of separation from what is a very busy street there on 47th. Um, so maybe some other uh, treatment could be thought about for the front yard or how, how that's done. I don't know. Brian has had his hand patiently up. Oh, well, I was just gonna maybe, um, um, Sarah kind of also mentioned it just now, that you know, to to have ground level units uh, on that busy street or what will be a busy street is is still doable. I mean, you could set those buildings back and slightly create a wonderful front garden yard, protected, you know, uh, transition. And then even that setback might help form an edge or border uh, from the commercial development to the the rest of the neighborhood. I think that the the safe thing would be to fill it up, you know, and to kind of try to maximize the the built value of the land by putting that retail building on the corner and, you know, at a lower scale, and it might be a nice little pavilion. But, you know, as many people have said, there's nothing worse than a lot of vacant storefronts. And uh, to me, the opportunity to have an open space that is, um, and kind of, I think it's kind of suggested in the rendering where there might in the new city building have um, some relationship to that uh, entry um, a and ideally because this developer seems to have you know um, a kind of holistic view of the development and what happens in the community and has listened to the community to have some you know program spaces that that really work as a wonderful garden open space uh, dedicated for the community but included as part of the project I think it's a great idea so I'm in favor of you know uh, dealing with the things you need to deal with for the housing to make it feel right uh, but um, uh, adding that feature of the open space and ideally having it, you know, a four season open space that um, is really useful all the time. You know, if you really wanted to add some more uh, space, a uh, retail space, you could always set back a little pavilion, you know, further back and still have a, a half kind of vest pocket park. So I think it, it, it also is um, kind of a little bit of a land bank, too, in terms of how you might um, think about the, uh, that space, that piece of land. You know, over time. Question for for the team here, um, because this rendering, what we've seen in the site plan doesn't necessarily match up with this rendering. So I just want to make sure we're all kind of clear on what we're looking at. If you go back to the site plan, and and and, and asking for clarification also from the team, but the existing parking lot would remain in 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 this option, and the the open space would happen on the west side of Marshfield. Um, so we would keep a, a parking lot fronting 47th, right, which is not necessarily entirely accurate with the rendering, right? The, the rendering is showing like green space all along 47th. And, and that may be something to think about, Brian, given your comments about, you know, is there a way to, if we do this, do we then have to buffer or extend that open space into a portion of 
of the surface parking lot. Um, oh, well, that's confusing. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, that's the, and, I, and that's why I want to point it out that the, yeah. these two things aren't exactly uh, jiving with each other. So one, if the team could take a second to confirm this, and then we can we can keep on with the discussion. This is uh, Scott. You're, you're you're correct. It, the the parking lot um, um, is actually owned by the uh, Goldblatt's building. Um, so you know there was there was some approvals that were necessary to be able to modify that parking lot, which we have obtained. Um, so we we can um, we're, we're hoping that the actual built. Uh, condition will be much more like what you're seeing in that rendering. Uh, that said, we also recognize that parking is a premium in that neighborhood. So uh, we don't necessarily want to completely eliminate the parking. So, you know, maybe we would do some kind of a hybrid where there's parking along the alley. I think we still need to study that. But I think if we can get support to have ground floor living space facing uh, 47th Street, I think that's a big win and uh, it'll allow us to do something really special there with green space uh, between the three flats and the Goldblatt's building. I think Gokola, you have your hand up. Yeah, briefly, I, I just wanna echo that. I think that the residential of these three flats makes a lot of sense if you do have the green space nearby. So the rendering, um, I know it's not it's not it's not it's not real right now, but I think if the developer could make the best effort to achieve something similar to that, that would be a perfect scenario because it's a win-win. Um, this community, as everybody knows, desperately needs green space, so this would be a great opportunity for that. And, um, so, but but I do understand, and thank you for the clarification about the parking lot. Uh, but it would be amazing if. if the render it can become a reality. Yeah. Gerardo, I, I echo that. Yeah, I, and thanks for, for pointing out that conflict. Um, yeah, I, I think it frankly changes the vision completely. <laughs> you know, if, if you've got a, a parking, you know, buffer, you know, that's segregating, you know, the, the flats from, from the um, vacated street. Um, that said, it, it, it appears that, you know, maybe, you know, again, maybe Scott mentioned it, um, that you can come from the back you know, and, and park along the alley, very much akin to what the other option, you know, depicted. You know, I think you can achieve both. I would like to say it's uh, 2.22, so we're over an hour on this project. Um, so perhaps if we have any other final comments that we wanna get out, now would be the time. Otherwise, uh, perhaps we move on to the next project. Um, so thank you. Thank you, right. jo Josh. Um, is the next project the S1 project? Sorry, say that again? Is the next project an S1 project? Yes, it is. Okay, I will recluse myself and okay. thank you guys. All right, Good luck. Thanks. thanks, Brian. Yep. yep. Thanks, everyone. Um, all right, uh, so we will now move to the second item on the agenda. Uh, to the applicant team, please clearly state your name and your relation to the project prior to speaking. You have 30 minutes to present this proposal. Committee members, please hold your comments and questions until after each presentation. Uh, I think, David, do you have the ability to share your screen? Hey, Josh, Brian? Uh, this is Brian, I I'll be... Yeah doing it uh, i'm still seeing the other presentation and uh oh. it says that i'm not all right let me see it just dis just disappeared josh just now <laughs> okay thank you brian are you still having issues sharing your screen yeah okay it says it's disabled for me let me see uh, brian please try now Okay, uh, there we go. Okay. Um, all right. 
Uh, the Altenheim line development framework plan located in the 24th and 28th wards. The applicant proposes to explore recreational opportunities for an over two mile section of elevated rail that lies between Taylor Street and Fillmore Street from Washtenaw Avenue to Cicero Avenue. The project will identify the highest and best use of industrial and commercial parcels, build a sense of community ownership and control, support local economic growth and develop strategies for equitable investment and anti-displacement. This is the first of its kind coming to the COD um, as this is a like a, an area plan. Um, so just keep that in mind as we listen to the presentation uh, and then we can get into it after Brian and the team are finished. Um, and that's it. All right, thanks Brian. <laughs> Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Josh. And uh, good afternoon to all the uh, members of the Committee on Design and everyone else who's in attendance. Uh, my name is Brian Hacker. I'm a coordinating planner with the uh, West Region team in the Department of Planning and Development, and the uh, DPD project manager uh, for the uh, Alden Heimline Development Framework Plan. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, this project is being led by DPD, but we've got a lot of partners and assistance on this. Uh, we're working closely with uh, CDOT, uh, as well as the uh, uh, 24th Ward and Alderman Michael Scott Jr., who really drove the vision for this uh, project, or at least, you know, uh, helped to along with uh, the department and others. And uh, I've also been uh, engaging with the Department of Housing. So this is a very collaborative effort. And then uh, on the uh, consultant side, uh, our assistance is being led there by uh, Skidmore Owings and Merrill, as well as a number of uh, sub-consultants there. And uh, we are also partnering with the North Lawndale Community Coordinating Council, or NLCCC, who are our uh, community partners and helping us with uh, engagement and communications. Uh, so I'll be joined today, uh, assisting me in the presentation by uh, David Scully from SOM, uh, Paul Peters from Hood Design Studio, and Catherine Darnstadt by, or, I'm sorry, of uh, Leighton Design. And then uh, we've also got Karen Kay from uh, SB Friedman here to uh, support us as well. For our uh, agenda for the presentation, uh, so this is a pretty uh, complex project that has a lot of uh, facets to it. I'll be starting off by giving some background on, uh, you know, the study scope of work, uh, providing a summary of the community engagement. Uh, David's gonna be helping with that. Uh, Paul from Hood will mostly be covering the uh, open space and recreational concepts for the uh, actual trail on the uh, elevated rail line. And uh, Catherine from Layton will be covering primarily the uh, focus areas for equitable redevelopment. And uh, David and I will be uh, going over the next steps to uh, close it out. So to uh, provide some background on the project and the work that we've done in the community so far, uh, we're going into this first section here. Uh, as Josh stated, so uh, the main aspects of, uh, or so I should say the main goals of this project are to look at uh, open space and recreation opportunities for the actual elevated rail line called the uh, Altenheim line, which is uh, owned by the CSX Railroad. But we also wanna take a look at the many opportunity sites that are in the area. There's a lot of vacant land in uh, North Lawndale and uh, East and West Garfield Park that's adjacent to the uh, study area and the, the line. Uh, we also want to uh, conduct this study to allow the community to really put their imprint on this project and uh, tell us uh, how this can best benefit their, uh, um, you know, their community in the west side at large. Uh, we also, because of the redevelopment opportunities that are uh, in this area, want to consider how it can support the local economy, provide jobs in the community, and uh, commercial amenities for the folks who live there. And then finally, too, you know, we want to be uh, aware of, uh, you know, the potential disparate impacts that might result from, uh, you know, a large investment in a uh, amenity on the west side, particularly of uh, uh, an area that's mostly low income, uh, brown and black community. So we're considering strategies for uh, how the investment can be equitable and how it can, uh, you know, combat uh, the displacement that might unintentionally result from uh, a large investment such as, uh, as this. Sorry. 
Let's give an overview of the timeline here. Uh, you know, we're in the very last stages here. We've uh, this began over the summer. We conducted three community meetings that were uh, in person and virtual, a combination of the the two. So we've uh, engaged with the community uh, quite a bit. We've completed a market analysis, drafted uh, design concepts uh, for redevelopment, open space, and now we're getting into this last stage here where we'll be drafting the plan itself and uh, ideally moving towards a presentation before uh, the plan commission as well as uh, this committee here. This is a map of the uh, portion of the Altenheim line that we're considering for the study, uh, as well as the study area that we're looking at in the broader terms here. As you can see on the west side, uh, it's kind of light, but this hashed area is the uh, Invest Southwest RFP site at Roosevelt and Costner uh, that will uh, ideally be uh, announced uh, soon. I'm not sure if we have a date for it, but I know that uh, it's it's soon. So you know you can see that the um, uh, section of the uh, rail line is also intersected by Independence Boulevard, so it's kind of part of the uh, boulevard system. Uh, going further to the east around Homan, you've got the uh, former Sears headquarters there, a lot of beautiful historic buildings at Homan Square, where the redevelopment efforts are ongoing. And as you get towards the east, you're in close proximity to Douglas Park and uh, Ogden Avenue, near the uh, Western Avenue, where you've got a uh, center of activity there with Mount Sinai Hospital, the Cinespace campus, which is very large, and then also the uh, new Ogden Commons development, with, with, uh, which is a uh, partnership of Mount Sinai and several other um, uh, entities to uh, create a new mixed use uh, campus there. This is a lovely drone uh, image of the actual uh, elevated rail line here near Homan Avenue, so you can see uh, obviously downtown in the distance, but in the, uh, you know, foreground here, the home and square campus, uh, if you look, you know, towards the bottom of the image there, you can see there is a uh, existing uh, uh, urban farm that's on the rail line. So it's already uh, having some active use here. And you can see the uh, width of it here. There are two rail lines that are on it uh, that are rarely used, uh, but you know, it does have active rail tracks on it currently. But in addition to that, there's quite a bit of width that can be utilized for a, a, you know, an open space project. And then this image is looking to the west uh, at the same location. So you know, I think just these images provide a nice context showing that there's a number of um, you know, current uh, um, conditions that exist on there already. You've got, you know, the urban farm, there's a kind of a prairie meadow area, as well as some more uh, heavily uh, wooded area uh, sections of it as well. So uh, to kind of build off of what I was just saying, uh, we've had some preliminary talks with CSX about the potential to purchase, uh, you know, the entire railroad, uh, but it, it's quite possible because of the strategic connections that the uh, railroad provides to some other freight lines, as well as to O'Hare Airport, that they may want to maintain some ownership there. So uh, a rails with trails scenario is something that we're considering and that you know we've looked at other examples of. And then I, uh, this slide provides a uh, sort of zoomed out version, and you know we just want to outline uh, you know how important a project like this could be, uh, not just to the adjacent communities, but to the west side uh, at large, you know because of its connection to the boulevard system, as I mentioned, and other large uh, you know open space uh, amenities like Garfield Park and Douglas Park. Uh, it's also in proximity to uh, you know west side uh, nodes of activity like the Illinois Medical District. And as you go further east to the West Loop, you know, it brings you to the uh, doorstep of downtown. So we want to look at, uh, you know, the uh, obviously the study area, but even going beyond that, you know, a, a walkable pedestrian oriented neighborhood uh, that surrounds it and uh, safe multimodal connections to uh, surrounding amenities as well. Just to give you an idea of the demographics in the area, as I mentioned, you know, this is a uh, mostly black community uh, that uh, is within the study area. It covers parts of North Lawndale, East Garfield Park, West Garfield Park. Uh, there's a population of roughly 67,500. Uh, you know, many in this area are, are low income, a lot of low income households. Uh, there is a significantly uh, higher portion of the uh, residents here that are unemployed than in other areas of the city. 
and uh, it's a relatively young community as well. So uh, there have been other plans that have been completed for this area, most uh, prominently the uh, North Lawndale Quality of Life Plan that was completed in 2018. There's a lot of overlap between this project and that, particularly in, uh, you know, that plan's focus on uh, active transportation and wellness, uh, strategies for greening vacant properties in the community, local economic development, and, uh, you know, anti-displacement and affordability uh, priorities as well. Beyond that plan, uh, DPD is very active in uh, North Lawndale. There's a lot of projects happening here, as well as some other organizations that we partner with. Uh, but I already mentioned the Roosevelt Costner RFP uh, site, which is at the west end of the uh, study uh, area. Uh, but then there's also a uh, Invest Southwest RFP on Ogden Avenue for a uh, block of city owned property where a developer has already been selected to uh, complete a, a mixed use project that will include multifamily housing, retail, and a, a community uh, arts and technology center. But uh, there's also um, uh, the Reclaiming Communities project, which is an effort to build a affordable single family homes on vacant properties. And then uh, the Steens Family Foundation uh, is working on their Tulsa 1920 project which is an ambitious effort to attract Black-owned businesses to North Lawndale to help reactivate its commercial corridors. Uh, so I'm going to stop right here and hand it off to David Scully from SOM to carry us through the rest of the section. David, uh, right. it's all yours. Just give me the cues. Thanks, Brian. Uh, everybody, David Scully, Associate Director uh, at Skid Moorings and Merrill in the Urban Design Practice. And, you know, just one of the things when we started off this project was really looking at other communities, how could we learn from the line itself, the 606 and other efforts around the country? Next slide. So, you know, we, we started really with the 606 as a comparable with something that's been recently done. We had a lot of internal knowledge from the folks at CDOT and, and folks at, um, you know, sort of the Trust for Public Land who are really helpful in giving us an understanding of what, you know, what it took to do the 606 and what there were some, you know, sort of places that we can, uh, you know, sort of evolve that process. Uh, you know, as, uh, as was mentioned, this is a rails and trails. So, you know, just in plan, though, we have actually a fair amount more land than the 606 does typically. Uh, we have roughly about 110 feet uh, width. So we have, we have a lot of space to play with, even with that rail right, right of way that may need to stay. Next slide. Uh, there are some pinch points, though, and when we started to look at this in section and understood both the ownership of the CSX rail line and those parcels, as well as the uh, you know, sort of key intersections where it crossed the street. And you know, we have a very amount of conditions from you know, sort of width, as well as you know, sort of some places it's a retaining wall, some places it's a berm. Uh, so there's a lot of you know, sort of opportunity or uh, you know, sort of design you know, sort of methods that will need to take place to, to really uh, make this a reality. Next slide. Uh, we also did a robust community engagement effort and you know, sort of it was great really hearing from the residents what was a priority on their mind, how that really you know, sort of helped to inform uh, all of the design concepts and the focus areas that we developed throughout. But you know, some of the key points about reflecting the history and culture of the community, uh, access and you know, ac accessibility of the line being you know, sort of a key point. Uh, you know, sort of finding those real opportunities to, to focus on equitable development and inclusive development in the area, uh, and a focus on jobs really being a key element that we heard from the neighborhood. Next slide. Uh, we also looked at the market and, you know, sort of Karen uh, and, and our team at SB Friedman really gave us a, a great, you know, sort of standing of, of where we are. Uh, you know, sort of both the, the, the good of having, you know, sort of a, a pretty rich cross section of multifamily residential for sale of homes, commercial and industrial uh, all over the community. Uh, but of course, you know, sort of like many communities uh, with the similar demographics, there are barriers to really getting things done and, and financing projects and so really making sure that we could uh, understand that framework and then use that to create a strategy. Next slide. Uh, so, you know, we, we started off with really what we're calling an equitable invest investment framework that really starts with supporting existing residents because we heard a lot from the community about you know how do we make sure that folks 
in the community, if this happens, don't get displaced like the 606. A lot of the folks that were that we heard from were really worried about that displacement pressure and the story that happened, you know, kind of to the north. So how to really make sure that folks are stable and supported in their own homes and Department of Housing was really helpful with that. Renovating and, and reactivating existing buildings, finding opportunities for infill, and then the focus on jobs as mentioned earlier. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it to uh, Paul to talk a little bit about the trail, and then uh, and then uh, Catherine will give a little bit on the uh, development focus areas. Paul, thank you, David. Paul Peters, principal with Hood Design Studio. I'm going to be talking about the community arts and heritage trail. And when we worked with the community, kind of the key three key themes developed out of that. Next slide, please. One was they wanted to integrate the history and stories and narratives of the site and the neighborhoods and the community. And so we began to look at the local heritage, arts and culture as a whole. We also heard, heard that people were really interested in the existing ecology and the biodiversity of the line. And this idea of building and strengthening what was already there, what people were already doing. And the third piece was looking at arts and community arts as a whole. And it, one of the main feedbacks that we heard was you know, ranging, things ranging from an outdoor museum to places for installation and sculpture. And could that be integrated into spaces for active and passive recreation? And lastly, related to access for all, creating a space, a line that uh, is equitable for all that live and work across the line. So looking at points of access. So first starting off, with ecology, looking at strengthening and diversifying the existing ecologies, we began to map what was there today. And we noticed there are three typologies of the landscape. There's an existing forest, an old forest, a beautiful canopy of trees that exist. There are um, uh, habitable meadows for, uh, that are actually have high biodiversity values. And there are existing gardens, such as Home, Home and Rails Garden that exists today that people are using for food or even for pleasure. So we began to set up this almost like a film strip. As you move through, you have these strands of landscape that change as you move across the line. So taking what's there today, really strengthening it to increase the biodiversity uh, for this area, the neighborhood, and the larger patchwork of the city. As you can see, it ties into the large parks and Independence Boulevard. Next slide, please. And just looking at an overview of these ideas as we begin to tie together history, ecology, and the arts, we've created this idea for a two mile community art and heritage trail. And so as you move along, the ecology is changing, there's places for art, for music, uh, and as well places for recreation. And thinking about how can we begin to tie in the histories and heritage into the site, we're gonna walk through some of those ideas now. So first we began with reinforcing existing patterns and uses. So we have nine points of access that we heard from the community that these are priority points of access, starting at Costner on the left, we on the west side and moving all the way to California on the east. So recognizing that these key points of access providing ADA accessible, you know, universal accessible uh, design for each one of these points. So thinking about ramps, uh, as well as uh, stairs and potentially lifts for these areas. Next slide, please. From there, we began to look at the heritage along the line and looking at three ways to integrate the history into the site and thinking about the path itself. Could there be integration of you know, um, symbols or text along the path as you move along, but also thinking about opportunities for views out into the city itself. Are there important historic buildings or sites or places that we wanna look at. On the east, we know that there's an opportunity for a great view of downtown. Also the places where we have these points of access, can we create these gates and these armatures that begin to integrate uh, a history in an artful way as access points and gateways into the line. And so we've looked at a set of these, uh, five of them from the Costner gate to the Independence gate, Holman gate, Sacramento gate, and the California gate. And lastly, the integration of the arts. We heard some main ideas related to this, everything, you know, again, integration of a skate park that could have outdoor music, uh, having a stoop for people to do spoken word or hip hop, 
a place for uh, an outdoor cinema where there could be, you know, thinking about some of these uh, brick walls that could be used for projection and also the integration of sculpture using uh, machines that could allow for installations of art to change over time. And so thinking about how these elements of art could be integrated into this biodiverse uh, landscape. Next slide, please. So we're gonna look at three preliminary scenarios that we've begun to look at as examples. The first going from left to right, so west to east, looking at the Parkway Theater, which is the intersection of Independence Boulevard, then moving east at the Homan Square Community Center, thinking about community arts and music center there as it exists on the line. And third, this notion of a civic green. So we know there's gonna be a large new development on the east end that bookends it. And so can we have this more of a, a civic space with a view to downtown. So we'll walk through these three ideas. First, starting with the Parkway Theater. You can see here we're up above. The line is um, on structure, the rail line's on structure, uh, and it's at a crossroads with Independence Boulevard. So the idea here is to create a stoop, almost a set of bleachers that step down to Independence. So you can begin to think about above and below. There could be a stage below. Again, this can be more informal or formal, depending on the program needs. And then the gateways, kind of buttressing Independence Boulevard that can great in integrate uh, history into the line. And you can see here the interpretation of, of the forest. It can be an orchard, it can be a woodland clearing. It can be more of a naturalized forest as it integrates into that existing landscape. Next slide, please. And in section, this is cut along Independence Boulevard. We're looking to the west. So this idea that each one of these moments we're thinking about heritage, ecology, and the arts. And so here, this idea of the arts stepping down onto independence for performance, ecology using the woodland for creating microclimate, and then heritage thinking, integrating uh, stories and histories into the gateways. Next slide, please. So preliminary view that we're beginning to work on at the top of the stoop here, independence to your right, the gateways, the trail, the path moving through the woodland, stepping down to independence. Next slide, please. The Community Arts and Music Center. Here we have um, Homan Square. Next slide, please. And the existing Homan Rails Farm. And so building on Homan Rails Farm and expanding that, thinking about how these different uses can come together. A sculpted lawn that could have a view out to the building to the um, south for projection. Beer garden situated in a meadow. So we have the meadow landscape here and a gateway over top of the street. Next slide, please. You can see the access points as well ramping down. So in section, thinking about a community arts and music center, can we have a space that could be used for outdoor performances, building on uh, the adjacent buildings that are there today and also the school. So you can imagine the kids coming out into the space and using it for performance, dance, or even exhibiting their work. Next slide, please. Beginning to develop a set of ideas. You can see here the building integrating across the rail line projection, thinking about a lawn for uh, outdoor gathering, a gateway coming across and connecting to uh, the street below. Next slide, please. So lastly is the Civic Green. So here we're on the furthest east, the bookend, the site with the new development. And we're up, up high and then it begins to slope down. So it goes from high uh, on the west and sloping down to the east. And this is an opportunity here to create some views out to the rest of the city. Next slide, please. So here, thinking about creating a large civic green with a hill, you can imagine people could gather for a performance. There could be a plaza with water jets seating underneath of a bosque for a microclimate. And then in the winter, this could be used for sledding uh, as well, and just an outdoor gathering space. In the, in the uh, non-winter months, thinking about this as a prairie meadow and a butterfly garden as you begin to move around the lawn. Next slide, please. So again, here thinking about arts and ecology and history, uh, thinking about the downtown views, using upgrading a public plaza, and then a large uh, uh, passive lawn. Next slide, please. Again, this opportunity to get up using the topography to create prospect out to the city, and to kind of reorient oneself, and also using the landform to create a, a central gathering place for the community. Next slide, please. And you can see here, you know, the advantage of a lawn uh, and topography, it gives us an opportunity for sledding in the winter. Thank you.
so as we had each of those, you know, sort of key points that that and so Paul walked through, we also developed a series of focus areas that really, you know, tried to break through with the understanding that, you know, there's there's all sorts of vacant lots and, you know, sort of vacant buildings in the community that will need to be addressed over time. But where can we have the most impact and have, you know, sort of a catalytic impact in, into the neighborhood? So developing, you know, sort of in addition to those, you know, sort of several points, uh, you know, of course, um, you know, having some opportunities for, uh, these development focus areas as well. So with that, uh, I'll pass it to Catherine to talk through each of those uh, locations. Thanks, David. Um, if you go to the next slide, Brian, um, I'll introduce myself. Uh, Catherine Darnstead with Late Design. Um, we worked through with this great team around these focus areas and started to think about where are we going to see not only um, momentum around existing activities um, adjacent to the line on the north and the south sides, um, uh, but then also how do we fit, fit into the information that we're hearing from our community and me meetings around engaging and telling the stories of history and culture of the neighborhood, and of course looking at the larger quality of life plans and always at the core supporting jobs and housing. Within that, we looked and, and developed five focus areas, um, and we'll walk through each of them um, through this presentation. Where we, and we'll start with Homan Square, which um, had a focus around um, residential and work. Um, if you go back one slide, sorry. Um, thanks, Brian. Um, then also Lawndale Plaza, looking at retail and economy. This is where the existing cine space, um, uh, cine, cinema that's currently vacant is located and also the um, uh, grocery store. Then we also will look at uh, Central Park Theater as a hub for activating historic arts and culture that will be anchored by the Central Park Theater that um, many of you might have saw and visited during the architecture biennial. And then finally walking through and looking at uh, Pulaski and Campus Green or Civic Green on the east side and then the Pulaski as another residential hub. And now next slide for Brian, thank you, as we look at Home and Square um, as a live work hub. And this is where we also are looking at these in terms of priorities to start development because there's already development and momentum happening. Um, we each slide and each of these focus areas will have the same series of slides for your reference. We wanna start with the existing conditions and this hub around Home and Square, you have the tower, you have um, the school, you have um, existing, a lot of existing community functions and the North Lawndale employment network. Um, and that is also the current and main access point to the line itself. So it made sense for us to start to build um, from there. You'll also see on these maps adjacencies to other study areas. And so a home and or focus area. So home and square is directly adjacent to the Lawndale Plaza and then um, within a block distance from the Central Park Theater focus area. Next slide. Within this, the vision that we started to develop is looking at um, activating vacant parcels um, and supporting existing developments. So what you'll see in some of these initial massings is are areas where we can start to integrate new um, housing at various scales. To the um, southwest of Altenheim and Holman, we see some new townhomes uh, um, um, to the south of the line taking over a current parking lot, two parking lots that exist on the site. And then to the north side in the yellow bar building, looking at new multifamily, higher density housing that would be adjacent to an area that would have an existing rehabbed Allstate building and also a renovated existing parking structure. Why we decided to keep a parking structure and started to look at that as an area for initial opportunities, because we started to see that as an, the trail becomes enhanced and more people are accessing it, the additional residential and demand on the area, we don't wanna put parking towards the street or create new parking areas. So can we reuse an existing structure and then rethink of some of these large rooftops as areas for large scale community solar projects that could then in turn kind of feed into a green economy along this uh, stretch of the corridor. Next slide. And we learned from, as always, what are some great um, examples that we can look at. So some incredible housing opportunities, thinking about um, diversity of housing opportunities. So you'll always see different scales of housing that we'll be looking at when we have that incorporated in mixed use housing. 
thinking about, as Paul mentioned before, the various ways we're accessing the trail and the adjacent amenities and program that come um, through the trail, because this is about concurrent activities um, and not um, sole activities. So we want to create a variety of uses. And then finally, thinking about um, adaptive reuse um, structures of both parking and buildings so that we start to weave those into um, a revitalized uh, corridor. Next slide. And as we talked about very quickly, we want to look at that corner where you have the image on the left is showing the Allstate building. So this became a priority area in terms of development. We have the Allstate building is that red brick building, which will become um, future um, uh, office. And then we're looking at the parking lot adjacent to it as a future multifamily residential building with the rehab parking off to the right itself. And then the image is showing the initial um, massing that we shared at our last community meeting as well. So you're seeing the same images that were also shared at our community meeting in December. Next slide. The Lawndale Plaza, this is where we have the existing Cineplex um, and then also a grocery store. Um, here we are looking at enhancing retail opportunities and looking at the Roosevelt Street edge, Roosevelt and Holman Street edges as opportunities to create a better pedestrian visual experience, but then also provide more small scale retail opportunities to tie into um, some of those community plans that Brian mentioned earlier that we are seeing um, at, in demand. Next slide. With that, we're seeing some initial massing. So again, looking at smaller retail buildings, again, directly related to the type of retail development that is happening as part of those quality of life plans. Next slide. And looking at what does what are these opportunities look like? It's uh, we have some great opportunities and examples to think about increasing a pedestrian walkway adjacent to um, low density um, markets, and then also starting to think about where can we start to increase, you know, more pathways and views and gardens within this public realm, so it becomes a more pedestrian experience rather than a vehicular experience. Um, and the next slide will show how that could start to look. Um, on the left, we're um, in the parking lot looking north towards home and square you can see the tower in the background and the right is showing the view when we start to build out some of these smaller retail buildings um, that could provide uh, uses and tie directly in with the adjacent north lawndale employment network and the programs that are happening there next slide Moving on to the Central Park Theater, um, we are looking at this area as an active cultural um, and residential destination um, and with direct line tie in um, to all of these access points to the trail itself. It is a large area, which it does have a pretty um, dense congregation concentration of vacant lots, as you can see um, on this existing site plan itself. Next slide. With that, we're looking at quite a bit of residential um, development, but also thinking about how do we anchor the Roosevelt and Central Park intersection as a you know, true um, urban edge and or urban corner where we have business and commercial spaces at that edge um, to complement um, the surrounding residential. We're also looking at at the Western edge, um, new larger scale commercial spaces for single use or two use tenants. And then thinking about how the Central Park Theater as well can start to utilize their block of properties um, with that currently have uh, structures, but then also adjacent parking. Um, and can that be um, reactivated into new uses? Next slide. And there are many examples across the city of thinking about um, unique mixed use developments from the libraries to micro retailing. And of course, on the right, we have wonderful examples of um, reactivating historic assets with arts and culture. Um, you can see the Stony Island Arts Bank. And for those not familiar, the bottom right photo is the current Central Park Theater for reference. Next slide. And here on Roosevelt, currently the image on the left you're seeing, we have the bit of low density and vacant lots on the north side of Roosevelt with Central Park on theater on the south side of Roosevelt and thinking about that being reactivated with new higher density multifamily or mixed use developments um, along that corridor edge. Next slide. 
The Pulaski Framework Plan, so now we're west of the line. Um, this is our westernmost study area that we looked at, and this is where we thought of as another opportunity for smaller scale residential and infill housing and an opportunity to tie in with um, different neighborhood and residential developments that are already happening across the area. We wanted to take advantage to the sites, the vacant, the block of vacant lots to the north of the line that are highlighted in um, note A. And then to the south of the line, there is an active um, manufacturing property there that we looked at. Are, can we beautify some of their existing properties? Because they are a large job contributor to the area. Um, but in the next slide, you can see we started to think about um, what's the best way to beautify a necessary parking lot and start to think about cr creating that edge um, a little bit, um, uh, making that edge a little bit more appealing. And then also started to think about, well, how can we start to use their rooftops and their, their flat surfaces and horizontal surfaces as part of community solar and other environment green job um, opportunities. The residential, the lower scale residential was mostly to the north side of the line, as you can see in this image that consists of two to three flats and then also some um, three to four story multifamily housing um, along finishing off the Pulaski Road edge. Next slide. With for Pulaski, with that density of residentials and residential and that adjacency to an existing school, we saw that as an access park point uh, for the line itself, and started to think about you know how a garden and a park space fits within and becomes an amenity for a new community of residential. We also did look at what are how do you improve the public realm with the images on the right when it comes to parking and edges to really think about how we. Um, work through the parking lots that we have that are existing around that manufacturing hub. Next slide. And finally, starting to think about um, this edge of Pulaski as you're looking towards um, north on Pulaski towards the Altenheim line, which currently on the left has a vacant lot on both sides of Pulaski, but starting to create a new access part on the west side of Pulaski and then on the east side. Um, thinking about new housing and that housing being able to have an amenity of overlooking the line um, and then the um, amenity of walking across the street to be able to access the line. Next slide. And finally, to the eastern edge of the line, um, the, termination, the eastern termination point, the campus or as previously called Civic Green, seeing that as an opportunity um, to take this large um, open vacant area with a singular building on it and create an opportunity for, um, you know, new industrial and new um, job creation businesses that could go into this space. If you go to the next slide, we can start to look at um, what that might look like, where we're dedicating that northern edge of the um, of the line to the new access park and and that sledding hill that Paul showed previously, which ties into the adjacent kind of open and active space of the Hope Academy to the north, to the south of the line, because the line does this is where the line does curve and and connects to an active rail line. Um, we did see that southern edge as providing an opportunity for new industrial building to line the Roosevelt edge and then tucking parking further behind um, while activating the existing heavy timber building that's on the site. Next slide. And we have incredible examples of what that building could start to look like, both the industrial buildings on the right, thinking about Gotham Greens um, that we have within the city, but then also other examples of how that um, existing um, heavy timber and masonry building could be reactivated for new uses and that also can overlook have the amenity of overlooking the line or having direct connection and use um, adjacent to the line. And finally, in the last slide, um, thinking about that view, what we have currently looking um, towards Roosevelt um, on Washtenaw, looking at the existing building and then just the surrounding kind of open site and restoring um, the streetscape, the pedestrian way, and then thinking about um, a new light industrial building anchoring the corner along Roosevelt. And I think from here, if you go to the next slide, I uh, can hand it right back to Brian. Thank you. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, thank you, uh, Kathy and Paul. David, did you want to cover uh, this one and then I'll take the next? 
Yeah, that, that, I think we'll, here, by the way. <laughs> just to, yeah, we just got two more slides. This one to talk about, you know, kind of where we are in the process. So we're kind of, you know, sort of, you saw a lot of, you know, sketch views and, you know, sort of in progress diagrams. And, and so we presented to the community, uh, you know, kind of last month. Uh, but now we're kind of in the process of really, uh, you know, taking that final bit of feedback, uh, you know, taking another set of passes ourselves at refining those uh, eye level sketch montages, you know, sort of refining the 2D and 3D massing concepts, uh, developing guidelines. Uh, we'll think we have one more stakeholder meeting to hold, uh, and then really developing that draft report and, and putting that together and telling the story. Uh, and getting ready to hopefully, uh, you know, get approved. And, and, you know, this is really the first step in a larger process, which uh, uh, Brian will talk about now. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so just in terms of, of, you know, where this takes us from here, uh, you know, this framework plan is a, a necessary first step that we need to make of, of engaging with the, the community and, you know, taking a close look at, what we're working with and, you know, uh, what some of the, uh, you know, say like, uh, uh, you know, related, uh, um, you know, planning priorities might come out of a large investment in an open space amenity like this. So uh, obviously th these are not, you know, final design plans. There's much more engineering and design that needs to take place, you know, a phase one study, uh, you know, before uh, we can continue to move it ahead, but uh, obviously funding is, is a large issue, but, uh, you know, we've been talking about that uh, internally and, you know, with uh, folks who have experience on projects like this before and, you know, ways that this could maybe be phased in over time, as opposed to just one big, you know, investment in it. Uh, so, you know, these are issues that we're taking a look at to position ourselves for, you know, the next steps. And obviously the city does not control this land right now, just to make that clear. So, uh, you know, we need to talk more with uh, CSX to see like what that land ownership could look like, or if it's a lease or what have you. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a, just want to outline here that it's a process spanning many years in the future and there are many more steps, but this is that very important uh, first one. So thank you very much. And I will open it up to discussion now. And I also just want to say, uh, David, I'm going to pull down the presentation. I need to switch to my phone, unfortunately, but I'll be here to take uh, questions. But David will um, pull up the presentation if anyone wants to go back and review concepts. Thank you all. Um, OK, so then that is uh, the last thing on the agenda. Um, committee members, please take a moment to review any comments received from the public in the Q&A box, which I don't believe there are any. Um, otherwise, you could incorporate them into the discussion. Uh, as Brian had mentioned, again, this is like a long-term uh, plan. So this is a little different than what you have been reviewing. Um, so please take that into consideration as we um, discuss. Um, other than that, the floor is now yours for comments. Um, and questions to the applicant. Thank you. Josh, I see Hannah has her uh, hand. Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Hannah Shikawa. I'm with SITE. I am a landscape architecture professional. Um, and so I have a lot of questions about uh, kind of the use of this. Um, but before I get on that, I think, you know, there are two kind of big issues when I look at the 606, which I have been to many, many times. Um, first, it's similar to the Lakefront Trail in that bicycles and pedestrians um, really have a conflict at the 606. 606 is very, very narrow. Um, it is a multi-use trail and when there are bikers, there's a lot of accidents that happen or kind of roadblocks when people are walking side by side. And so with the wider dimension, is there any kind of discussion about separating pedestrians versus other modes of transportation? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great comment, uh, Hannah. Uh, specifically, People, we haven't gone into that depth of detail with the community. I definitely think it's a valid, valid point in providing enough of a dimension, whether it is uh, the decision of whether this is a multi-use path or it is separated, I think is still yet to be had. And even just thinking about the network around on the streets, right? Is there, you know, we think about how we integrate the adjacent streets. I think it's important to, you know, also think about this is raised up. And so points of access, 
uh, if you're on a bicycle or even other you know modes of, of uh, transportation that might not be you know walking. Um, I think you know tying into the existing streets will be important as well. So, but we haven't quite dipped into that level of detail. But I think that's a great point. Yeah, and Hannah, I think you know this this project being a framework. I mean, we're we're kind of in this weird place where we're we're kind of designing it, but not really designing it. You know, like trying to set the rules for when uh, you know sort of when the further studies can happen. So I think you know to to your point, because that's something that you know I was thinking as well, just experiencing the six hundred six, and you know we have this space. Uh, so that's something I think we we would probably explore putting into the guidelines, or you know finding some way to start to set the stage for the next group that gets into a deeper study about how to really uh, make sure that they're looking at the right, the right things. And I think that's a, a critical point. Yeah. And I, you know, I think when you were talking, there's a diagram about primary and secondary connections up to the trail. Um, you know, I, I have a feeling similar to the 606 that we're not going to be able to make a connection at every single street. And so I do think you know, really prioritizing that and thinking about where the bike trails are versus, you know, where may, maybe smaller residential streets may not need a connection. And so I, I really urge you to look at that and really prioritize and think about what form of access is provided at these areas. Um, and then the second big point that I, per, I have a personal connection with is I know of somebody who was actually killed at the 606. And it's because there are not a lot of police. Um, it's just not a very visible area. You, you know, you, a cop car can't get up there and there aren't a lot of uh, just policing on these. And we we just don't want more accidents to happen on a trail like this. And therefore, you know, I biggest concerns for me were like the, the beer garden that was kind of right in the middle that might obscure visibility, you know, all of those things I think really need to be considered in the lens of security. And so, especially for this trail, 606 gets a lot of traffic. I would imagine this one, you know, I, I don't know if you have done counts on how many people walk in these neighborhoods, but I think you really need to think about how to address visibility throughout the whole cor cor corridor. Um, and if there's a point where, you know, somebody can see from even below to above, that is very much appreciated. Um, and then I guess the other kind of point that I wanted to make was um, I would like to see a little bit more about how these development areas or are overlaid with the overall landscape plan. Um, I think there is a little bit of a lack of a connection between what's happening on top of the trail versus below. And there are definitely some key areas where you talked about, you know, theaters and such, or even the gardens above that happen. But if there's even more connections that can be made um, between the programming up on the trail and below and how, again, we connect these spaces. Like, is there a, um, a walkway on the side where some of these major developments happen up to the space or are there any bike routes? Um, you know, I, I really would like to see that happen in the ne next iteration. And those are my main points. Um, Thank you so much. It's such an important project, and I really am excited to see this. Thanks, Anna. Really, really great points, and we'll, we'll definitely uh, take that in and, and you know kind of put that in our work in the next iteration uh, to, to well, where we get into the final report. So, thank you. Thank you. I believe Juan uh, hand is next. Thanks. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Dewey, Catherine, thank you for for what you've shared. And I, David, I appreciate you framing this as a framework plan and just this moment to gather, you know, more commentary, right? Um, I just, as you, as you guys were presented, just wrote a list of questions or things that occurred to me. So I just want to kind of go one by one, if you don't mind. Ultimately, will the owner be the park district for this? Who, who in the end would own it? 
I can chime in here uh, from from DPD's perspective. We we don't we don't have an answer to that yet, right? Mm -hmm. So there's still that would be part of this long term implementation plan. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then, are there any organizations in the North Lawndale that are actively a part of the team? Like I, I think about an organization like Art West. Are there, is there anybody like that that's involved in this visioning in these early stages with you guys? So we've been working with uh, NLCCC, uh, who's you know sort of really really connected in, in that area, and mm -hmm. uh, working with Rodney and, and, and working with uh, with uh, with his team. So uh, that's been a kind of our main conduit into the neighborhood. And right. yeah, thinking of groups like Art West, I think we. We had a conversation with um, with D Case about kind of the involving artists and like it, in this framework, it's you know kind of maybe not as helpful. But we were thinking of that as maybe a recommendation for you know future studies like involving local artists at the forefront so that they can then you know really be part of the visioning and, and envision uh, how that's happening. And our West being in the community is a, is a you know key one. Um, uh, SAIC also has a presence uh, in Nichols Tower as well. Yeah, and, and the, way, the, the reason I ask, it's an obvious question, is one, like, you know, the study is fabulous, you know, in terms of these points of access, the relationship to the boulevard system, but, you know, the communities are so unique along there. And like, I think uh, in Holman Square in particular, I just know it too well because of some work we're doing there, but like the Sears and Roebuck Tower, uh, it's fascinating, not just because it's a tower, it's actually a community gathering point. And um, that parking lot comes alive, right, with get togethers. And I'm just wondering like how that can inform nodes along the way because they're already gathering points, right? And that how that informs your planning and how that creates a momentum for ideas. But that, you know, that's, that's grassroots information, right? And I only know it, not because I'm an expert, just because of some groups I've worked with there. So something like that could help inform this plan as well. Um, I, I think also, interestingly, um, we can use this 606, like this beta case, right? And um, I think, and, and even in the way that um, you guys have described, like one of my big critiques on the 606 has always been that, um, you know, there's, there's an alpha and omega on two sides. People love to say that the side on the east is really the beginning and the side on the west is the end, but that's not true. And unfortunately that also coincides with the demographics, right? And I know you put a lot of focus on the East and the views, and I think that's wonderful, but the site on the West and wherever that terminus is, and I know there's a bleeding through the Roosevelt and Costner and whatever happens where, you know, Fifth Avenue dives into Roosevelt, but I think there needs to be something that puts an emphasis on that. So there's an equality at both ends and something equally special, whatever that is, um, I think that's critical so that there isn't this weight shift, you know, or prominence just because the views are better to the east. So I would just um, encourage that. The other is that um, the the 606, for, for its challenges, it it also brings together every generation, from really small kids, and it becomes this nanny connector, right, to the elderly. Um, to the bikers, yes, and the runners, all the challenges that have been mentioned. But I think what the 606 also lacks are pro programmatic responses to all those generations. So something as benign as where's a restroom? Where's a public restroom for the nannies who have to make a diaper change, right? Um, can you tell this is coming from a dad with a 18 month old. Um, but I, I, I think those kinds of considerations should come into the kind of planning in the framework so that they're given consideration or inspiring programmatic opportunities, whatever those might be, right? It's just like those are, are endless possibilities. And um, the last one is just like, a, it's a curiosity thing because I was talking about the, the West 
we'll call it the alpha for now of this. Um, the C40 project that was going there at the Fifth Avenue, is that still alive? Will that conversation of sustainability play a role in this? Because it just seems like it would coincide. And that's it. Not sure if Brian's available, but I, I can answer that last one. The, the C40 project is uh, uh, on Fifth Avenue in Kedzie, basically. Um, so a little bit north of here, um, but it is, it actually went to plan commission um, uh, in the last, you know, late last year. Yeah, thanks for your comments, Juan. Really, really appreciate it. And you know that that last one specifically about the uh, the, the restrooms. We we had a, we had a fair amount of conversations about restrooms, and that kind of gets into the question of of the of the who operates it. Uh, and we had a really great discussion with some of the folks at CDOT um, about about that in particular, and you know what works well at you know sort of the. Um, the 606 and what, what doesn't and what they may have done differently. So I think that those are things that we're trying to take into consideration as we get into uh, some of the recommendations for, you know, kind of what, what needs to be explored further. Um, but that, that ability to, you know, stop at a key location is something that we're really interested in as well and, and trying to find ways to, to make sure we're illustrating and, and finding uh, those opportunities to, to uh, put those into the plan so that they, they get properly explored. Um, and then the, the, the last thing about the, the, that you brought up about, you know, kind of partnering with some of the community groups. The thing that really is interesting about this line is that um, we see it potentially as a phased opportunity. So instead of having to build a whole thing at once, like you have to do the 606, that, you know, we already have access at Holman, for instance, could that be a place where you actually then start to really beta test some of these, you know, concepts and get people used to coming up to the line, connect them with community groups, have sort of smaller scale activation, and then, you know, sort of start to really uh, look at how uh, future final design could, could happen. Awesome. Um, I believe Sarah had her hand up next. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it was a very interesting presentation and I can tell you really thought a lot about it. Um, I did have a few comments. One was just to think um, about whole families, like some of the comments about the 606. Um, it, the tra trail does tend to be used by walkers, bikers, people with children, families. And I didn't see a lot. I mean, the arts is great and everyone likes the arts, but I think people are going to come up on that trail with their whole family and want to hike through a garden or do something with their kids and attractions that appeal to, to people of all ages or have activities for all ages, you know, gardening or, or things um, or even more active recreation. I mean, this, these areas do need more safe parks for children to go to. And I know that's not probably part of the scope or the program, but thinking about how it could link to, to public parks where children can actually play near the trail um, would be a good thing to consider and see what, what spaces are nearby. Um, the other comment I had was just a general comment about the, the trail can create a lot of value. And I think that's something the West Side really needs. It needs investment, it needs value. And the 606 has done that almost in ways that have created some issues. But um, on the West Side, there's a lot of vacant lots. And when I see a lot of the proposals or thoughts about what developments could go in, I haven't seen a lot of single family. Um, and there was this one townhome proposal. But thinking about creating some communities or just block by block communities of, of low density residential that could be owned by people who will come and move into these communities is something that can help the west side because it's lost so much population that you know there is a demand for that and uh, low density isn't necessarily a bad thing in some of these neighborhoods it can mean stability and it can mean buyers that are going to invest in the the neighborhoods for a long period uh, the other question I had was, I feel like the east end of the trail is actually kind of a lost opportunity in terms of not, I mean, it's great that you're proposing a node and that the beautiful hill that you have there, but my question would be, number one, um, has it been looked at with the developments to the east and how it's going to engage with that neighborhood? Because actually that is a very actively developing part of IMD Tri-Taylor on the west. 
Um, there's single family homes going up there and there's sites that are, are being developed in the next five years with dense new neighborhood development. So those people are going to want to visit the park and that's kind of a way, you know, the start of the trail is very important. The people feel like it's a safe place to go. It's a nice place to go and that they want to be invited to get on the trail and then they'll be invited and, and discover all these other communities to the west. Um, I feel like that neighborhood to the, west, the east there is also lacking in retail. Um, they don't have a grocery store. They're, they're getting more dense with infill, and yet they don't have some of the, the amenities. And Chicago Hope is a very good organization. They built these beautiful athletic fields. It's a private school. But I feel like ways that could activate the sites on the east end of the trail with amenities or job job creating entities that could bring the community in more might be better than proposing, for instance, a warehouse or a, a truck yard or something of that nature. Like if it is industrial, it should be very inviting to um, to have places for people to come and maybe think about incorporating some retail in that east end where the people of that eastern neighborhood could use it. Um, I think that is a neighborhood that is worth engaging if you haven't already. And in a way, it may be hard to engage because it's a very new, diverse group of people that live over there and is not probably very even organized. Um, but it's like the neighborhood between Tri Taylor and Lawndale. Mm -hmm. It's a transitional area. Um, so those are, are my thoughts. And David, I could tackle a couple of these responses and then from for Sarah's questions. And those are all fantastic. And I'll try and get them all in order or hit them all in terms of the housing de density and the single family homes. Um, as mentioned, we were looking at what existing plans and, and initiatives were already in play. And one of them was the Reclaiming Communities plan, which is was previously called a thousand homes. And that might be how many people might know the plan um, uh, better. And that is existing organization looking to build a thousand single family homes within this area. And so to be complementary to their existing plan, which is already moving forward, we looked at that next scale of housing um, to start to propose that we know they're not going to be building. They're going to be looking at single family homes and maybe two flats. So let's look at different housing typologies to help fill out those sites. Um, um, as you're saying, as you were talking about. So that's how we approach some of our recommendations. Um, in terms of the Eastern site and thinking about how do we engage with the um, uh, Illinois Medical District, um, the Eastern edge and the active rail line does serve as a pretty heavy barrier between communities. And there is no direct access possible across those um, because it is an active rail line that's running north south that the Altenheim line um, runs into it. Um, and so, but I do think in terms of how do we start to pull that community to the grocery store that exists in North Lawndale and some of the retail opportunities, we could kind of look at that Eastern site as being part of the breadcrumbs, so to speak, that start to pull people um, into it, which I think would be a really um, interesting idea um, to think about. And David, if you want to add anything more. Um, one other point, sorry, one of the things that we did hear pretty resoundingly from the community meetings is like, where are the businesses that are going to create 500 jobs? Where do they go as part of this? Um, so thinking about we do have to create areas for job development and can job um, you know, job development and those types of businesses also anchor the east and the west ends of the line. Um, with Roosevelt and Costner in here, and we could start to treat it as, as an idea of, well, here's jobs, here's public space, here's, here's the threshold of your community, and please explore everything in between those two nodes. Yeah, I think, Sarah, your, your comments are right on, the, right on the money, and one of the things that we, we talked a little bit about, to, to Catherine's point, was like this, this idea of, you know, sort of both job generation uses, but uses that also um, support these sort of key anchors that are in the community, like the IMD, like uh, Cinespace. You know, so right now Cinespace is using this as uh, extra parking for their campus. So, you know, sort of how to, how to you know, then leverage that and potentially support community-based businesses that, you know, are hiring folks in the neighborhood or, 
you know, finding those opportunities for, for that small retail, as you mentioned. Uh, so that, I mean, you know, all these drawings are, are still in progress and, you know, so sort of maybe there's a way that we can, you know, evolve this to, to better illustrate uh, that concept that you were, you know, kind of discussing. Because I think, you know, that, you know, everything you talked about is, you know, sort of things that are on our mind uh, looking at these sites. Okay, thank you. I do understand the tracks are quite a barrier too. They they are a visual, but also kind of a neighborhood barrier in that part of the west side. Um, and bringing people across is, you know, the key, I think, to trying to activate. Great. Um, I believe Reed is next. Thank you, Josh. Um, and I wanted to also thank the team um, for uh, coming before us at this stage when there's still a lot to be determined. Um, it kind of <laughs> puts you on the line for a bunch of decisions that are still to come. Um, I just wanted to mention a, a few things quickly. Um, the first is the comment that was just made, so I won't spend as much time, but um, there's a lot of attention paid in this presentation to the the uh, the sort of linear um, east west uh, nature of this uh, of the installation and uh, although some of the specific installations look north and south I think there could be um, greater attention paid to the cross track kinds of attractors um, and, and uh, or at least in the in the in the presentation that could be emphasized more because the presentation itself doesn't quite talk about it that way. And because these tracks are mostly on the ground, um, it becomes a very, very significant issue, even if they're, they're part of a park um, or part of a park stream. The, the second thing I wanted to mention um, is something that is a little concerning to me, um, and it, it goes to the landscape um, proposal of the, the, the many different experiences Garden, reading from um, east to west, garden and meadow, forest, garden, meadow, garden, forest, meadow, forest, garden, meadow, forest. All of this within less than two miles. Um, and I would remind you that, that one of the things that's so successful about the High Line, um, on which I worked for about three years, um, is the fact that it's incredibly consistent it creates an incredibly consistent experience with a tremendous amount of diversity built into that experience in ways that people, that, that don't disrupt the consistency. So the famous flying benches are the same no matter where you go. Um, the famous plant materials are the same wherever you go, but they feather in and out of each other in different ways. Um, and so that the, 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 the thing you experience as you move through it changes even though you recognize the elements as creating a consistent overall um, approach to this that makes it feel like I'm in a park and I'm in a park that has an identity uh, to it. Uh, so that was, uh, that was the, the, the second thing. The third is also kind of been mentioned but mostly about the East and that's the termini of this. How do you end it? Um, especially with something that, uh, like on the High Line, for instance, got extended three times um, in the first 10 years. And so each time they ended it, they had to unend it um, and do it again. Um, but, the, but the beginnings and the ends of any of these kinds of things become critical. And though I think the plaza on the east begins to express that a little bit and attention to it, I think at their next level of development, this isn't meant as negative, it's just meant as a suggestion. At the next level of development, I think um, some more attention um, could be um, paid to that. Um, and then uh, I think everybody else has mentioned the things I would have mentioned. So that's it. Does the applicant want to respond? Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Reed. That's, that was all, all good. And I think that you know, this, was, this was, again, it was like kind of tricky because we are you know, we're, we're in this place where we're not like, you know, we don't have the, the fee to like really dig in and design it, you know, like, like you would, like you would, you know, maybe try and do if it were, you know, kind of a full project. Um, 
but trying to, you know, maybe set some of those rules up. So, I mean, that, I think everything you explained is something that, you know, sort of we can, you know, sort of integrate and start to talk about in our report as like, as this gets developed, you know, these are the key elements that need to be focused on and paid attention as it actually gets, uh, you know, sort of finally designed. Um, but I think there, that, you know, sort of question of, especially the beginning and the end, uh, you know, it's something that, that, you know, kind of we're going to try and uh, hopefully get a little bit maybe more, uh, more work on, on the Western end uh, and start to think about how that can, uh, you know, have at least the same level of fidelity as the East as we talk about, like, you know, we're starting with this two mile stretch and, and we went back and forth a lot through the process about where to, where to begin slash end it, like, you know, how to, you know, are there opportunities to go across Costner? Um, you know, we walked the line a fair amount, I think, between myself and Catherine and Louisa. We, we walked the whole thing probably two or three times uh, uh, just to try and figure out kind of where are those pinch points and where are those places that are, you know, opportunities potentially in the future. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll definitely bring all of that into, uh, into how we uh, put together this final report. But really appreciate the comments, Reed. Yeah, no problem. Just to reemphasize, I'm looking at, at, at page, as an image 25 out of 78. And maybe the way you could get at it, just following exactly up on what you're saying, David, um, instead of saying garden, meadow, forest, garden, meadow, forest, garden, garden, forest, meadow, 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 or you know, the way it's on the map there like that, which just looks like pages in a children's book, right? You know, one thing after another. Maybe the, the way to talk about it is just exactly as you said. We have three primary elements forests, gardens, and meadows, right? And how those are distributed is yet to be determined, um, but will be done, you know, in a way that there's a, that, that it ties it all together. I know you guys are geniuses at talking your way through. <laughs> um, so, but the, but, the um, but rather than showing it in, the, in these little choppy bits like this, because, you know, once you put something down, people oh. see it, right? And they're like, oh, hey, you, did, you promised me a garden from this block to this block, and why are you giving me forest now, right? So, you know, how you guys can approach that, uh, I, obviously you're gonna do a great job on it, um, but I, I'd be super careful about those kinds of suggestions. Mm. Well, right. the forest is also where there may be existing trees, so there could also be a, a way to I don't know, incorporate that into the presentation. Where are the best areas to preserve these existing landscapes that are already there? Yeah, and I don't know if Paul wants to chime in, but I think that, that was the intent of this is like looking at where there are already kind of large canopies of trees or, you know, sort of openings uh, to start to assign a, a, you know, sort of a, a character of what's existing and then build on that. Uh, but I do get Reed's point about like, does it, does this, you know, visually, um, you know, sort of, you know, promise too much, or you know, sort of break it, break up the the consistency of of what, you know, kind of would tie it together. Uh, maybe we can find a way to, to illustrate that in a, in a, you know, a different way, or you know, I don't know. What if, I'll let Paul, Paul also respond because his, his team <laughs> puts put this together, and I'm sure he has some thoughts on on uh, how to best do this. Um, I've also just been informed uh, we need to um, sort of be finishing around 345. So I'll just mention, I believe we have John Ronan next and Ann Thompson will be our last comment. Um, if anyone else has any other comments, feel free to either type it in the Q&A or email me. So thanks. Can I just add a very brief comment to just summarize that last topic? Uh, so this diagram you're seeing here on the screen is actually a a mapping of the existing, it's a diagram of the existing ecologies. So there already is forests, meadows, gardens being, gardens being kind of vague in terms of, it just means landscapes that people are making or using. So uh, it could be a vegetable garden, flower garden, a community garden. So the idea is to just build on those existing uses. So first starting with this diagram and then expanding on that. So the garden areas that you may see would be associated with new developments as well. And so the intention of it could be this active space. Thank you. All right, John. Thanks, Josh. Um, yeah, I think the plan in, in short is very comprehensive and aspirational. Um, I don't take exception to any single element that's been described. 
my questions are more about how it all fits together. And, and starting with the repurposed rail line, um, that uh, I'd be more interested to hear from the design team how you think the Altenheim line is different than the 606 and the High Line, rather than how it's the same. And for for one thing, I I, I think the High Line and the 606 were built in already very dense neighborhoods. And so there was a need there to provide recreation or, or different additional surface area, which I'm not sure is the case in this neighborhood. And, and so um, I wonder, after hearing this presentation, are the initiatives that Catherine described working at cross purposes to the reactivation uh, of this rail line? And, and uh, it seems we're loading up this rail line with all kinds of programs that could be happening at street level. But then uh, Catherine goes on to describe the desired uh, activation of economic development goals in the neighborhood. And I wonder if these two projects are working at cross purposes and, and could the rail line development be more focused in its mission, uh, say recreation or education? I, I didn't hear anything about education today. And I'm wondering if, um, given these gardens and forests and so forth, could there be an educational component uh, related to, to landscape and plants? And could you partner with the Chicago Botanical Garden or the Arboretum, uh, for example, uh, uh, such that the, uh, the rail line acts more of a, as a catalyst for economic development that's happening at the street? And I, don't, I didn't hear any story about linkage and how that's supposed to happen. And, and the way the project is presented, it's sort of a, if you build it, they will come approach. Like if we do all this development on the rail line, well, we're just expecting people to relocate here. And I wonder if it's not backwards, if, if uh, the develop, neighborhood development needs to come first to, to make the rail line uh, development uh, necessary and used. Um, those are my comments. Uh, great, great comments, Sean. I think that's that's one thing we're still kind of discussing as a team, like how to how to really talk about how this, you know, how would you start this? Uh, and right now it is sort of, uh, you know, like we have the focus areas, we have the line itself, but, you know, sort of where, where you maybe start with the line and maybe where you focus on uh, development wise is, is really going to be based off of, you know, kind of the, the opportunities at hand. And I think we're still trying to figure out kind of how to, you know, best, best frame all of those elements and allow it to happen organically, but with a, you know, sort of purpose or with a, with a goal. Because I think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I could, we could see the line potentially developing in phases, but then also these, you know, sort of development focus areas, you know, have a variety of different types of momentum, you know, the, the you know, center, center space or the, the, the center uh, theater, uh, the, the vacant theater that's here, folks are already talking about it as potentially, uh, you know, a uh, job training center, uh, you know, so how to really how this effort dovetails with all of those varying community efforts is something that still, we're still, I think, weaving together. But uh, we'll try and put something together for the for the final report to get to uh, that, you know, sort of clarity of like what what are some of the ways that this can really, you know, kind of move forward and and, and happen in a, in a maybe a little bit more of a fluid way than uh, you build the line first and then you do the focus areas or you do the focus areas first and then you build the line. Uh, it may be a combination of, of those working together to then uh, build that momentum up for the community. Thanks, David. I think Anne, I think you might be our last one. Yeah, I, I think I, I have hopefully a quick comment and I because I think it does build on a lot of what's just been said. And it's this idea around building um, I, I believe that this, this shows that there's a compelling opportunity here, but it doesn't completely describe the compelling vision. And I think without that kind of um, identity sort of mission statement that pulls all of this together, that's very specific to this opportunity, it's hard to connect the dots and it's hard for all of the brainstorming that you've done and all the work that you've done not to seem random. And so it's hard from a, a, 
and I'll speak from a development point of view to understand how does this happen? You know, sort of what drives it? What connects the opportunity of the rail to the development opportunities along the rail? So for instance, you know, if there's a specific program requirement, how does that inform what the development is along that part of the trail? So it feels to, I, I'm not getting all the connections that I need. And I think ultimately that'll impact your ability to build a compelling case for funding and to draw development here. Um, so I would sort of second a lot of what the last couple of people have spoken about, but developing this very um, strong identity for this and a sort of mission statement about what connects all of this. Because I think without that, I'm, I'm it feels like a lot of um, interesting, but I can't tell what connects all of it and what gives it its purpose to be here and very specific to this place. Oh, great comment, Anne. Really, really appreciate it. We'll, we'll definitely, that's something we're still, we're still refining. Hopefully we'll, we'll get to, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll refine it to the, to the level necessary for the, uh, for the final report, but really appreciate that. Uh, I, I appreciate it's hard when you're, when it's a framework and it's like, yeah. <laughs> it's and, and oh, I think some of this is like, how to, how do we, how do we give it enough where then it can get to that next step and that next level of, you know, sort of, oh, this is interesting. Let we can get federal funding to start to really dive into it further and explore it further. So we're 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 wrestling with that, but I think we're we're we'll we'll uh, you know do our best to uh, get to that level of I think a vision for what it could be and then kind of string it together. Okay. Um, I think that concludes uh, comments for this project. Again, if anyone has any other comments or um, questions, feel free to email those to me and I'll make sure that we review them before we uh, make any recommendations moving forward. Oh, one second. Um, I think right now we will adjourn the meeting. Um, before we adjourn though, uh, I'd like to thank you again on behalf of DPD for all of your critical thinking and thoughtful comments uh, on these two important projects. Um, and I believe uh, we are just going to roll into the executive session, but if you are uh, not part of the committee on design, uh, we ask that you exit the Zoom meeting. Um, again, thank you for attending.